Oi, Big John, doesn't I ken this podcast contains poetry by a Gonagall? Nay, THE Gonagall! Clevens! I'm offski. And I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast. Each month we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month we're reading The We Free Men, or Chalk It Up to Whiskey Business. And our guest is librarian (laughs) and podcaster Megan Dew. Welcome, Megan. Hi. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's a real pleasure. You are our our second librarian, is that right, Liz? I think so, unless we have some secret librarians. Because we had... uh, Amy on, who was our first librarian, to talk about guards, guards. So I'm very excited to have another one. But you're also a podcaster, Megan. I am. I actually run the podcast at my library at the moment. So we've got a channel where we record a few of our events and put them up. And during this time of us being closed, we've also been doing a short story club one where some of the librarians talk about a short story they've been reading for a week. So, yeah. That's really cool. It's been pretty good fun. And how long have you been a librarian? Technically about a year now in terms of having the word librarian in the title, because I guess it's one of those things where not everyone who works in a library is working as a librarian officially. But if we say work in a library, then it's been about three years. Cool. Mm-hmm. What a great job. Like I've always coveted that as a job. It was always the job I wanted to do when I was little. And uh, after that, I kind of did a whole lot of other bookish jobs and things like that. And then it kind of just circled back around to librarian, which is pretty sweet. I mean, really, it's just about being looking for jobs in which people would be like that's like reading all day right and then you have to be all no but that would apply to pretty much every every job in books which is pretty great so and it's also the closest since i uh, work in the collections and reader development team it's like buying books and talking about books which are both things that i consider somewhat leisure activities anyway so that works out pretty well Mm. awesome Mm. well thank you so much for joining us how did you find terry pratchett I'm afraid I have pretty much the same story that everyone you have talked to on this podcast so far has, which is they were recommended to me by, I think when I was in my mid-teens, I had two friends who everything they liked, I wanted to like as well. And when there was deviation from that, I would just pretend that I liked the thing because that was way less socially awkward than actually saying, oh, I don't quite get it yet. You two both have older siblings and are therefore slightly more mature in your humor and your music tastes and all that than I am. And I'm still catching up. Um, so they recommended the Discworld books. And I think I read one of the early Rincewind ones and I didn't really love it at the time. I was still very much steeped in the very serious high fantasy type stuff. I was the person who read Lord of the Rings every single year after they read it at like 10 and then went back to it every single year after that. Wait, how fast can you read Lord of the Rings? Um, uh, at the time, it I think the first time it took me three months easily, but it was one of those books where my parents started reading it and I wanted to know how it finished faster than they were willing to read it to me. So it was very motivating. I highly suggest like anyone who is trying to get their kid into a specific book that's or get them to read beyond their reading level, just start reading it to them and then they'll be desperate to know what happens and they'll be really motivated all of a sudden. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So I didn't love it. Uh, I don't think I quite got the humor at the time and – then I went back to the guards ones a few years later and was all, this is fantastic. Why did I not get this at the time? This is great. So it was sort of a, not a big fan at the start. And then I read every single one I could get my hands on. So. Rinton strikes again. Yeah. I do like him now. I like some of his, the last continent is fantastic. So it's really grown on me over time, but it wasn't an instant love. Yeah. I think he's one you have to ease into. Like he's not the intro to the series. He's, part of it that you come to later for, for a lot of people not everyone but yeah 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 no i think that's fair this is my first time reading the we free men and indeed any of the books about tiffany aching i didn't read them at the time because they were flagged very clearly and obviously as Discworld for kids 
And I don't know why that didn't appeal to me at the time. I mean, I'd read most of Terry's other books for kids, but I guess I read them when I was a teenager. And when this was coming out, you know, I was in my early to mid 20s. uh, And perhaps I was like, uh, I'm not really into reading kids books right now, which is a lie because I was reading Harry Potter, if I remember rightly. So, you know, but I don't know. I kind of skipped them and I waited until the next quote unquote adult Pratchett book came out. So, yeah, this was quite an eye opener for me and I'm very excited. But we should we should get into it because, you know, this is an amazing book and we've got to discuss it. Mm. And we should begin with a reading of the blurb. Before I read the blurb, I do just have to limber up my mouth because I'm for much of this podcast there's going to be some uh, this is probably a, like a content warning. There'll there'll be strong faux Scottish accents. Uh, and I, I use the term faux Scottish uh, advisedly. Uh, I'm sure this is not particularly accurate, um, <laughs> but uh, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, apologies to all my Glaswegian and other Scottish friends, by the way. But here we go. Here's the blurb for the Wee Freeman. There's trouble on the aching farm. A monster in the river, a headless horseman in the driveway, and nightmares spreading down from the hills. And now Tiffany Aching's little brother has been stolen by the Queen of the Fairies although Tiffany doesn't think this is entirely a bad thing. Tiffany's got to get him back. To help her, she has a weapon, a frying pan, her granny's magic book, well, Diseases of the Sheep, actually, and... Clivens, what about us, you dafty? Oh, yes, uh, she's got the Nakmak Fiegel, the wee free men, the fightin', thievin', tiny blue-skinned pixies who were thrown out of fairyland for being drunk and disorderly. Now, look, the... I got it. First of all, I object to that definition of what happened to the Nakmak Fiegel. They were not thrown out for being drunk and disorderly. No. They left. Um, Says them. Well, that, that's true. I guess there are two sides to this story. <laughs> we never hear the other side, but that's reasonable. That's a classic Pratchett blurb. Here's a list of funny things I put in the book, basically. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it's great, you know, and I don't think I ever even read the blurb when it came out how awful is that i don't even remember it's too long ago you know how they get people to say like nice things about books on the back of them they're like oh brilliant a whip smart take from a blah 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 and then like famous author's name the back of mine has cribens there's nay a better tailor magic and adventure on the disc by rob anybody big man of the knack feel <laughs> <laughs> well i guess you know if you if you're going to get an endorsement from a fictional character get one from someone who's in the book yeah Maybe not from one that pretty much actively says that they never read anything and are afraid of words, though. That might not be the best person mm-hmm. to recommend a book. So <laughs> That's very cool. But, uh, more of that, please. People, characters from books blurring their own books. I would, I'd like more of that in the world. That would be grand. I'd be, I'd be into it. Mm. And we should say also, before we get into the content of the book, this is another book with chapters from Pratchett. All of his younger readers' books tend to have chapters, which is quite a departure from the, the adult Discworld books. Uh, but it starts in an auspicious manner. I really like this weird device that Miss Tick, the uh, witch, constructs to sense weirdness. And she doesn't really explain what it is or how it works or what it's for, but you just get the description. I mean, there's an illustration in my edition because I read the illustrated edition of the book, but it's described as having string and a, a stone with a hole in it and a, an egg and bits of it seem to pass impossibly through other bits of it. And it actually reminds me there's a concept in Doctor Who, or Early Drink, sorry, listeners, yeah. uh, where Time Lords make these impossible things where they sort of set all these objects balancing on each other and set them rotating uh, as kind of a test of their understanding of, like, cosmic forces and stuff like that. And this sort of, yeah, struck me as a very similar kind of thing. Or it's kind of like those things that everyone's been doing in isolation, like Rube Go- oh, Rube Gold- Goldberg machine? Machines, Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say Rube Ginsburg, and I was like, nope, I'm getting Ruth confused in there. <laughs> uh, Ruth Bader Goldberg? Goldberg machine. machine. <laughs> like, it's it's an impossible machine where things fall on other things, and then it makes a very fair and just ruling at the mm-hmm. end. <laughs> I like it. But yeah, I, I, I mean, Miss Tick, what a great name for a witch. Um, Took me 25 pages to get that that was a pun. Really? Oh my yeah. gosh. I didn't realize it until you just said it. That's awful. It's right there in front of me. So. Yeah. Maybe oh. my pun like senses have just become very sensitive since working with you, Liz, but I was on it from the get go. Yeah, I liked it a lot. But also, you know, we got a couple of footnotes at the start. And there's very few footnotes in this book. Hmm. 
It's like he forgot about them. That's okay. He's had other things going on. Um, there's no, there's very few footnotes, and also death does not appear in this book, even though it is a book about death in many ways. Uh, but we we soon she senses something up is up, Miss Tick. There's a disturbance in the forest, and she looks into a bowl of ink to discover what it is. After her elbow indicates that there's possibly a witch in somewhere there shouldn't be a witch, so she wants to get a closer look. Mm. Um, and then we cut to nine year old Tiffany Aching messing about in the river, tickling a trout. <laughs> like I mean, I've heard she this is a them phrase. Laughing. Yeah, yeah, it sounds I, rude, though. It does. It seems like it would be a euphemism for something, but I think it's actually just literally that. Is that a thing you can do? Can you like tickle trout, or is it because she's like good with animals? No, I think I think it is meant to be a thing you can do. I mean, it just makes me think of Animal Crossing. Um, <laughs> but right now, doesn't everything make everyone think of Animal Crossing? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we meet her for the first time, uh, and almost immediately after we meet her, uh, we also meet her brother. The prison, yeah. The prison. Mm, in Wentworth? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that connection never occurred to me, but yes. Mm. It is a famous Australian prison for our non-Australian listeners, uh, about which there is a television program. But yes, we meet her brother, and she also, I mean, we get to know a bit about Tiffany. I, I really liked this introduction. Yeah, like you can, I can't remember which details came where because it's, I think the dress came later, the details about it, but you pretty quickly get to know all you need to about how she thinks and how independent she is. Like that's pretty much straight out there. I can't remember the words that he uses to do that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and she's fascinated by words um, and she's read the dictionary front to back because no one told her that's not how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> which I- I really I enjoyed that as well, which is a great idea. Like the no one told you you weren't supposed to. Like what can people achieve if they're not penned in by expectations? And I thought that was a really cool thing to set up her character from the beginning because she is very literal and she isn't penned in, despite perhaps she could be because she's got a lot of responsibility in her life despite being quite young. Mm, yeah, and living on a farm and having all of the farm duties and etc. And sort of her life is mapped out for her because it sort of says what people are expected to do in their town. Like she's expected to grow up to be someone's wife and she learns to read and write because that's what women do. But, yeah, it's just it's interesting. Mm. Terry Pratchett also gets the word susurrus or susurrus. I'm not quite sure. It's one of those ones where you're like, this is a word you don't often get to say. So um, saying it out loud but uh, is, is fun. And it is a great word. Three years before this book was published, he wrote a piece for the London Literary Festival where they asked authors to write about their favourite word. And this is the one he picked. Um, Mm. And then three years later, he got it into this book. But yeah, it's a great little intro. It's a really good way to kind of develop her character in a way that's really specifically her without shoving a lot of details in there, having the multiple thoughts and and how she thinks about them at the same time. I really loved how he did that. And... Mm. Sussurus, I like how they're using that as the important secrets behind the door and it keeps going because it's one of those words where when you read it or if you say it to yourself, you have the urge to keep saying it to yourself. Like it's a word that just keeps continuing. It's not just a sussurus, it's a sussurus, a sussurus, a Like it's just a word that could kind of go on and on. It doesn't have a really clear ending, like a word that keeps spelling itself. So It's like nanny og and banana. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and now I have the urge to say banana na 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 on and on, which I will stop there because. So. But we could do a whole podcast of that. Like honestly, I would listen to it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> spin off, spin off, special mini one episode, listener. one guaranteed listener, a special ASMR <laughs> banana episode. <laughs> uh, that'd be grand. Uh, one more thing about sorceress, though, it sounds like sorceress, which is lady witches. But, yeah. uh, very good. Mm-hmm. I have made that connection. I like that a lot. Um, the other thing, of course, that happens this early part of the book is we do meet certain little blue, red-haired men, or two of them anyway, in a tiny little... Well, it's not really described. It's not exactly sure what it is. It's like a little basket that they're using as a boat. Mm. But they bugger off almost as quickly as they're spotted because they sense that something dangerous is coming, which is the sorceress that you know, Tiffany is sensing. Um, and she senses it too. And she kind of takes a step back from the river just before a horrible green hag comes out and tries to eat her. And she's not real happy about that. So she goes home, has a think about it. She does uh, some research. Like she looks into her, her book. 
Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, she looks does into some measuring of, of soup dishes. As the librarian, I approve. Do research, then act based mm-hmm. on the research you have accumulated. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's very wise. So she has very, you know, methodical mindset. And I mean, when she's researching it, yeah, the measuring I really liked as well. She's like, oh, as big as a soup plate. And again, I think we've this has been referenced in a previous book that we've discussed on the podcast. But that's a classic fairy tale trope. Uh, like the the story I always remember it from is a version of the magic tinderbox where. You strike these tinder boxes and you um, you summon Mind these magical July. dogs, yeah. and they're described by how big their eyes are, like whether they're the size of saucers or the size of soup plates or the size of dinner plates. Um, which is yeah, I'm like, I mean, it's very evocative, but it's not very accurate, as Tiffany complains. Yeah, just say eight inches. Yeah, Can you imagine like extremely literal fairy tales that spell out every detail. <laughs> I feel um, like they'd be the only ones that Tiffany would approve of. So, <laughs> mm. I would love to read one though, like the it's like a rewritten Rapunzel that has everything laid out really clearly, like exactly how her hair is styled, why doesn't it fall out when it's climbed, all of that stuff. Has has like a blueprint of how the tower works, how regularly she shampoos and how she washes her hair, mm. how she disposes of all the extra hair that comes out because the longer your hair is, every time you brush it, you just end up feeling like some sort of strange cat that has accumulated mm-hmm. all the extra hair. So what, does she just have a giant hairball in the corner? Like that's the only... Just rolls it up and it gets bigger throws and throws it bigger. out the window every day and that's actually what's creating some sort of barrier around the tower is just the little hairballs growing into... Anyway. Yeah, and how, yeah. how do you even brush it all the way to the end? That's very difficult without assistance. What if you got, like a Roomba but for brushing hair? Like if you lay down on the ground? <laughs> Oh, that sounds horrendous. It's gonna it does, it sounds like there's a real potential for problems with that. It does. It does. <laughs> While Tiffany's doing this, we do learn a bit more about the history of the area, the chalk. Um, it's it's called the chalk because it has chalk underneath. Uh, it's sheep country largely, so there's a lot of sheep farmers. Uh, but yeah, she, she does some research and then she goes back to the river and she ties a bag of sweets. This was the bit that got me, right? She uses her brother as bait to tempt this monster out of the river and then she smacks it with a frying pan, which is fantastic. But the bit that got mm. me is that to use him as bait, she didn't just put some sweets next to the river. She nails like a little stake into the ground and ties the sweets to it so it's a trap for her brother to go and investigate, but also so he won't wander off. I'm like, that is a level of planning <laughs> for this that I was not prepared for and I loved it so much. We got to think through every eventuality. Like you can't have him wandering off at the wrong moment. Yeah. Or wandering into the monster at the wrong moment that would be yeah. really inconvenient. So. Yeah, mm. true. But he's not scared because he can't see the monster, so he's all right. He can't see it at all, or he just doesn't notice because he's too busy eating sweeties. I feel like he can't see it because isn't there like a whole thing about she sees things that other people don't because she's paying different attention. Mm. Well, I guess that's true. Yeah, I, I guess that didn't occur to me, but. I mean, he doesn't seem very perturbed. Because he didn't have sweets the first time the monster attacked and she, like, rescued him, basically. He just was screaming about wanting to go to the toilet, which is his normal thing. And if he was scared by it, he would have surely not wanted to go back to the the water's edge. But I don't know when she offered him the sweets, if it was before they went or after. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. His Um, desire for sweets could just be so strong that even though he was slightly scared by the encounter that mm. it's just like that's fine if there are sweets in this for me it's it's gonna be okay so yeah. Yeah, i'll get past it yeah. i'm yeah. into it let's do it yeah but what a great first chapter it's just so much has already happened we've, been, mm. we've met all these characters who are all new to the disc world there's nobody familiar here i mean mystic is a bit familiar because she is quite witchy she's very much cut from the same cloth as nanny og and granny weatherwax but she has her own kind of thing going on as well which i quite liked She's very. She is a distinct character. She could have felt a bit like a, you know, a carbon copy, but she doesn't, which I like. Yeah, or an Audi version, but no, she feels like a addition, not a copy. Yeah, yeah, and she's like, I've got to find out more about this girl. What's going on? She goes on about how it should be impossible to have a witch on chalk country because you can only grow witches over proper stone, and that she will have none of her magical powers when she's hanging out on chalk it's absorbent or it's hungry earth yeah uh and she <laughs> she echoes the the terrible old uh cliche when she says well i can't do but i can teach and i'm like no <laughs> it's so <laughs> terrible but at the same time it's a funny illusion 
I found it really surprising that she was so certain that there just couldn't be a witch on the chalk because isn't the whole point of the witches is that they don't take that sort of thing for granted and they question everything or like look at what's actually happening and then make their decisions based on that not what should be the case it's like well okay maybe there shouldn't be witches on the chalk but there obviously is a witch on the chalk so therefore you're wrong about it not being possible for there to be witches on the chalk therefore move on (laughs) so yeah yeah Yeah. she seemed very she seemed very sure for someone who is meant to be a, a group of people who are used to not being sure, except about specific circumstances, if that makes sense, or not relying on generalizations. So, yeah, hmm. I thought yeah. that was really interesting. Hmm. I see what you mean. For me, I mean, as the book goes on, it seems pretty clear that Granny Aching is a witch in all but name and yeah. that, you know, they just have a different kind of witchery on the chalk, possibly because at some point the Baron or his... Um, you know, ancestors decided they didn't want to have truck with witches and the witches were like, well, we'll just stick around, but we won't call ourselves witches. So it's it, that history is uh, it's kind of mysterious and interesting to me. And I don't know if, if we find out more about it later, but yeah, I thought I thought it made a kind of sense. But you're right, like she does seem awfully incredulous. But then I guess, you know, if you think about Granny, she often like says, but this isn't how things are like and is quite annoyed by them not being the way she wants them to be. So I think I think there's a there's a streak of that stubbornness in, in the witches. Personality comes through despite philosophy. Yeah. That's cool. Um hmm. but uh Miss Tick gets uh, her wish. Uh she manages to infiltrate a group of um itinerant teachers <laughs> wandering around uh trying to teach things <laughs> in return for okay. um fruit and vegetables and other foodstuffs. Can I read you this quote that I love from it though? Yeah, yeah. They live rough lives, surviving on what food they could earn from giving lessons to anyone who would listen. When no one would listen, they lived on baked hedgehog, they went to sleep under the stars, which the math teachers would count, the astronomy teachers would measure, and the literature teachers would name. The geography teachers got lost in the woods and fell into bear traps. Yeah, that was one of my favourites. I really enjoyed this. And I have no idea if this is at all based in truth, but it kind of makes sense that, you know, there's no public school system in a feudal society so teachers show up at the village like people from a circus and they set up their tents and they're like, come and pay for some learnings. With an egg or any root vegetables, major root vegetables are accepted. Yeah, and I do really enjoy the signs on the various teachers' tents. Um, mm-hmm. They're fantastic. And Tiffany heads down to the, the place because she's like, well, I need to find out more about this creature. This book isn't really very useful. Maybe some of the teachers know. And she talks to like a teacher who does biology basically, and he clearly knows nothing that's of any and he's use. Like, to you her. Know, oh, you're the one who asked all the, the questions last time. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that was said, so said with much less happiness than you would assume from <laughs> theoretically should yeah. be encouraging and yet frustrating. So Just, as long as it's not the one about where the baby hedgehogs come from again. <laughs> Which is, like, it doesn't make any sense that she would ask that given, you know, the bit later on about how she grew up on a farm. She knows how that stuff works. She must have been staring. The hedgehogs are prickly. Well, I guess that is the sticking point, isn't it? Literally, yeah. (laughs) Literally. Oh, no, I made a pun. I didn't mean to. Um, Or a pun, if we're going to do the way that she pronounces pun later. But maybe we should leave it till we get to that. A pun yeah. or a play on words. No, it's fine. That's that's a traditional Pratchett way of doing it. This is not the first time that showed up. I think there's quite a few Pratchetty things that I'm pretty sure this is not their first appearance, but I really enjoyed the way he deployed some of his older ideas in this book. It was just like seeing an old friend in a new outfit. It was cool. <laughs> but yeah, uh, she doesn't get any answers from that guy. So she goes looking for another teacher and finds the tent with the note on it that says, I can teach you a lesson you won't forget in a hurry, <laughs> which, of course, leads her to Miss Tick, who very quickly sizes her up and decides, yeah, you're, you're a witch. And Tiffany does the same with her. It's like, you're a witch, aren't you? <laughs> Even though witches aren't allowed. Immediately. Yeah. It's, I didn't know what to expect going into this book. I'm thinking she's going to become a witch, but... What I wasn't expecting was that basically she's already a witch. She just doesn't know it. And that's kind of really what's happening. She's already got the right mindset. She's already got the determination, the way of thinking. She just doesn't know how to use it. You know that joke about Harry Potter that Neville would have got it done in four books? (laughs) Yeah. And Tiffany would have got it done in two. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Do you think it's like sort of witching in this case is like a lot of professions where for some people it's they kind of already know 
what they need to do and what they need is like kind of to learn the framework in like why and or how it should be done a certain way, I suppose. And then in, for other people, it's like they know all the theory and what they need is the practice. I feel like she's kind of had the mental practice or something. And if she was being taught formally how to be a witch, it would just be putting like a framework around it or something like that. But I can't remember with the other Pratchett books if that's the case for all witches or if other witches need to be taught the thinking part but pick up herbs really easily or something like that. So I, I don't know. It feels like she's got the thinking part, but not the how would I mix these herbs together or make this person think I'm doing this particular trick or I don't know, something like that. It does seem like it's the other way around. Yeah. Mm. 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 That's something about witches where it's like, oh, you're a, you are a witch. Like you just need to learn how to do it properly. In mm. the same way that, you know, in, in the Discworld, wizards are wizards, but the implication is they have to go and learn how to be bored with magic so that they don't, like, destroy the world, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, whereas this is quite a different kind of, you don't know how to do this, mm. but you should. But it's such a great, it's a great conversation that the two of them have, just, like, back and forth, back and forth. Three of them. There's the toad as well. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't forget he's, the toad. He's a bit yellow, but he's feeling a bit, like, he's a bit unwell. Yeah, he's a yellow sick toad. Oh, no. Yeah, I didn't pick that up either. I found that in some discussion and Pratchett swore that he didn't do it. He was lying, of course, but he swore that he didn't make the pun. So it's not his fault. <laughs> like, you got me, you rascal. But yeah, it's great. I love, I love this back and forth. But it, I also love how she wants to believe that it's going to be kind of magical and wonderful. But she also has so much practicality and realism in her soul that she's like, but it won't be. Because there's that great bit where she talks about what the witches and, and everybody looks like in the storybooks and how that's all a scam. Yeah, I love that. And then you get the first sort of flashback, and there's lots of these in the book, to her memories of Granny Aching, who's such a presence even though she's died a year before. And I really enjoyed that. It could have been really sad, but it's actually kind of beautiful. Yeah. And it's kind of the thing you were saying about her practical side battling with her side that wants things to be magical. There's, I thought that was summed up really well when she leaves and she doesn't look back because either the tent will still be there and that's kind of dull or it'll be gone and that's mystical but not practical. Like it's summed up much better mm. in the book, obviously. Mm. But So she chooses not to know. It's like Schrodinger's childhood. Mm. <laughs> Shredding his childhood. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I did love the flashbacks. And these first couple kind of set up the idea that Granny Aching could do magic, but it's not that kind of magic. She's got the sort of weird oven that she brings lambs back to life with, mm. by which means, you know, sort of thaws them out when they're a bit frozen. Which is, is totally setting up that idea, which I love, that all magic is is that magic, that most of it is magic that doesn't look like magic when you look really closely at it. And that helps people not notice the actual magic magic mm. in a way. Yeah. And uh, we also get Tiffany not knowing how to pronounce words that she's read, which is <laughs> a theme through the book. Uh, the, uh, my favorite, I think the first big one is, is my favorite one, which is when she says uh, persicology. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. Now, I, maybe now we know why Granny Weatherwax calls it headology. Mm -hmm. She's comfortable with pronouncing that word. She can't be having with pronouncing things properly. <laughs> yeah. And we also get a bit of backstory here that's quite important where they talk about the history of witches in the Chalk Hills. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, there was an old woman left to die out in winter because the Baron's son Roland went missing about a year ago and everyone decided this old lady who lived in the woods was a witch and must have eaten him. So they went and trashed her house and she was homeless and then they didn't feed her and just left her to freeze. And it's just horrible. And it's setting up the whole class thing and the barren thing as well. Mm. People mm. who are trying to exert power over the earth that they don't have a right to have. Mm. Because there's that whole divide between nature and arguably the modern world or the human world as well. And the barren kind of represents that because there's the whole thing that you can see the rumblings of something going to happen with her father because I haven't read the whole series but her dad has a lot of rumblings of we really own this and like rise up against the the baron and the mum's always like no no calm down with that so that feeds into that as well do we think the woman was a witch or was she just an old lady who no was she a bit was eccentric I think she was just an old lady I think that's mm. that's pretty clearly what they're talking about yeah mm. 
Uh, it also seems like the actual witches in these books are much more careful at not looking like witches in places where they shouldn't look like witches. Mm. Hence the, if there was a witch, it was Granny Aching, and no one would have used that word to describe her at all, even though she was actually more of that than this old lady ever was. So, mm. Mm. Yeah, and the more, I mean, the more you learn about Granny Aching and her position in society there, the more and more it resembles the way people have that sort of equal parts fear and respect of someone like Granny Weatherwax or Nanny Og even. Mm. She's also much more a country witch because her main thing is being a shepherd. Mm. And as we find out towards the end of the book, Granny and Nanny don't really see themselves as having another profession, even though that's traditional for witches, because their profession is doing the magical witchy stuff that most witches Mm. don't need to do on a day-to-day basis, watching Mm. the edges of the world for stuff that might come in and hurt everyone which does seem to be what a lot of their books are about as well. Mm. But anyway, Tiffany has this discussion. One of my favorite bits of which is when she says, can I learn to be a witch? And Miss Tick is like, yeah. And she's like, is there a witching school? She's like, yeah, there's a witching school. (laughs) And she's imagining it. And I don't know if you've got this in the non-illustrated edition, but a few pages after that, there's a mock flyer for what the witch school might be that Tiffany is obviously imagining. I I don't have that. It says, Hovering Grange, educating young witches since 1903. And then it just goes on with, like, teachers who work there. And we offer lessons in necromancy, chiromancy, hieromancy, loweromancy, pyromancy, ansy-pansy-mancy, and and fancy-mancy. So it's, it's, it's... very silly, uh, but a lot of fun. Also, era wise, with this coming out in 2003 and Harry Potter coming out in 97 and sort of rising to prominence in the late 90s, I wonder if that is kind of a nod to that. Like, this is a witch book, but this is not her going to Hogwarts and doing that sort of thing. Like, not purely that, but I did wonder if that's kind of a bit of a. Because you can't, I think, write a book about a young person finding out they're a witch in that era and not sort of try and distinguish yourself. Mm. inescapable context yeah mm. and interestingly the the original idea for the book apparently was about a, a young boy in Lanka and that's it changed over time and became Tiffany there was a young boy in Lanka who turned out to be a bit of a no. <laughs> a canker <Banker? laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> good I'm glad we both have the <laughs> alternative there um, yeah. but yes so she gets some answers Tiffany refuses to let Miss Tick know about the little blue men that she's seen. And it's not clear why she thinks that's important, except I think she, well, it's kind of implied she just feels like she needs to keep something to herself. And uh, she goes back home where, unbeknownst to her, the little blue men are now watching her. uh, Maybe they've been watching her the whole time. It hasn't been, but yeah, they've been looking for someone. Yeah, they've been looking for someone, which their dialogue when they see her smash the Jenny green teeth over the head indicates they were looking for someone and they go back home to tell someone they found them. But now they're watching her actively. Um, she sort of hears them bashing about in her room. In the dollhouse? Fighting the dolls in the dollhouse. That was so funny. I love that so much. Because you still haven't really met them. And just, I mean, look, this is not the first time you meet them in the Discworld books. They actually appear in Carpe Yagulum, which is a few books before this. And they appear in like the opening sequence of that book as well. But then they vanish and you don't see them again until about halfway through. So you don't know who they are. There's just these tiny little slightly Scottish people. And you're like, what the hell is this all about? And then there's vampires for half a book. And then they turn up and you're like, what? But here there's so much a part of the story and a big part of the world. But she goes home. She can't really see what they're up to and decides not to let on that she knows they're there. She goes back to the fairy book she was reading and looks through the pictures. And is like, well, these are all nonsense, except for this one that looks. And the way she describes it is it looks like someone was painting something they'd actually seen. And the painting that she's describing is is pretty much uh, a real painting, the fairy fella's masterstroke. Uh, there's an author note about this. And I can't help but wonder if Terry Pratchett mainly knows about the fairy fella's masterstroke because there is a Queen song called the fairy fella's masterstroke. That he found in his glove box. Yes, exactly. Uh, we know he's a Queen fan. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very small painting and it's by a guy named Richard Dad. It's this famous painting of fairies and there is a version of it in the illustrated edition which is the one from the Discworld, which has the little fegal in the corner and she sees him it's described in the text as him giving a rude gesture it's actually he's given the finger uh <laughs> in the illustration and i'm like how old is this book meant to be for like this there's, there's some rude stuff in here and that's when she goes out into the privy to read by herself and she hears something she catches them trying to steal a sheep he catches them trying to steal some eggs and she tells them <laughs> off. 
and they are scared of her. And just the imagery of like one of them putting the egg back and like polishing it up, and also they're like, "Oh, we were just cold, and we were hiding under this chicken, and we thought there were stones under it, so we we're just we we're just helping by removing these stones." Oh, it's so it's. A, I mean, look, it's a hoary old stereotype of Scottish people that they are penny pinchers, like they 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 hang on to all their wealth with everything they can. But yeah, you know, I like that here it's been sort of transmogrified into fighting and stealing stuff. Uh, you know, they're more Highlanders than anything else. And uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed them. Oh, but the dollhouse one was my favorite sequence, I think, because they come across like toy soldiers and a teddy bear with one leg and they still manage to like not be easily winning a fight against all these inanimate objects because they're actually quietly fighting each other as well in the dark. <laughs> Just so yeah, I, good. I, I, I totally love the Missy's idea of people who enjoy the the fighting so much that if there's no one else to fight they'll just start fighting each other anyway because once you've started I mean why would you stop if you had didn't unless you had to yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's just a good great. time to be had yeah but yeah she gets real angry with them and uh, she realizes how strong and how fast they are and after she's caught them and got angry with them they start doing things for her around the farm to sort of appease her and make her feel like everything's okay so they like fill up a water bucket they fetch logs and they do all this stuff really quickly even though they're tiny it's so weird because it's that traditional tale of like the little fairy creatures that do chores for you but they don't want a saucer of milk they're just doing it so they don't get in trouble (laughs) for the things that they were stealing Um, is that like in another witch's book as well like with the saucer of milk being left out I think you're right. I think there's also a saucer of milk in something else. But Maybe Lords and Ladies. I feel like that was one where, like, Granny's sorting out that woman's house to attract a fairy thing. But what, oh, if you, you remember, like please let us know. Yeah. yeah. I the, and This is not the only point. That there's a couple other things that I remember, and I'm sure that they were in previous Discworld books, but tried as I might, I couldn't find where they were, even though I'm sure they're ones we've talked about on the podcast before. Because it actually turns out it's quite difficult to go back through what is now two and a half years worth of notes and podcast recordings to find something that you once said. Uh, So yes, if you know, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. Uh, But Tiffany needs more answers. So she decides to go back and see Miss Tick again. And on the way, she's attacked by a headless horseman who appears out of nowhere. And so does some snow. It's not winter on the chalk, but the snow appears out of nowhere. And this headless horseman attacks her. (laughs) Snow, oh God. Um, (laughs) But luckily the the little blue men have been following her and they know what to do. They fight him, but they also give her great advice. My One of my favorite things in the book where they say, let's stare him in the eyes. And, uh, and she's like, he hasn't got any eyes. And they say, Craven's here, hang on, no, look him in the eyes he hasn't got. And I'm like, this is <laughs> awesome. And they head by his horse. That's their thing. I mean, look, they're just a lot of fun. <laughs> they're just a lot of fun. Shouldn't there be a headless horse as well, just for, like, the look of the thing? I don't know, like... No, because, I mean, then no one can see. But isn't it implied that he can see, but, like, he just doesn't have a head? Mm. Or is the horse, like, doing all the seeing? Because, I mean, what's that one from The Godfather up to? I mean, I feel like it's probably (laughs) got... Not very much. (laughs) You know, funny. I mean, what do they do with the rest of the horse? I mean, it's such a waste of resources. I probably took it to like a cannery or something. Oh, it's gross. It's awful. It's awful. Really quickly and came back again. Because it would be easier to take it somewhere that wants it than to dig a hole and put it in. It's like a whole lot of horse. It's horse true. Horses big. Well, it's most of the horse, in fact, yeah. So if you know what they did with the rest of the horse from the Godfather, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, but like in Star Star Wars, they did a whole extra movie about like a throwaway line. So surely. Surely. <laughs> okay. All right. We're waiting for that. The um, mm-hmm. the Sophia uh, Coppola. We're looking at you. <laughs> Godfather anthology film series. Thank you. Anyway, she goes back to see Miss Tick after escaping the headless horseman, and she's gone. She's not there. She's decided she has to go off and get help. This is serious. This thing that she's sensed is something coming from another world intruding into the disc world, which is a real problem for the disc world. Constantly, they really need to get. Oh, I almost said they really need to get better border security, and I just cannot <gasps> really seriously say those words. It makes me ill. Um, but they do need to do something because, like, they have this problem. So she's gone, but she's left her talking toad behind so that Tiffany yeah. has someone to talk to. You toad goes... line instead. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, oh, Sorry, man. I can't help it. It's a disease. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I look. I've I've learned to live with it. Uh, mm-hmm. 
And so it's the next chapter where she really meets the small blue men properly. With the Toad's advice, she lures them out by getting some of her dad's strong alcohol. Um, sheep liniment. Sheep liniment, yes. But not before they overhear her saying she wishes her cat wouldn't eat so many birds and they start <laughs> dressing up as birds to lure the cat and beat him up. <laughs> oh, and then so the closing image of like he's like he hasn't learned his lesson and he's like stalking a nest and instead of tiny birds in the nest, it's feels again. Cheap, cheap. Yeah, yeah, cheap, cheap. Yes, come on. Yeah, oh, it's so good. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Uh, uh, yeah. She talks to the toad about them. And she's like, did they, st-? cause her brother, this is where her brother goes missing. Like she comes mm. back to the farm and her parents are freaking out because her brother was supposed to go up to watch the shearing with some of her older sisters and he has vanished. Nobody can find him. They don't know where he is. Everybody's panicking. She starts to help, but she also gets a sense that something's off. Something's not right. This isn't just he's wandered off. So she talks to the toad and says, did these little guys steal him? And he's like, no, they wouldn't have done that, but they might be able to help you. So she gets out the liniment to summon them and she talks to them and discovers that they're called the Knack Mac Fiegel or the We Free Men who have a, a rallying cry, which I really enjoyed, which was a uh, Nay King, Nay Quinn, Nay Lives, Nay Master, we will not be fooled again. And I'm like, that's, there's so many, there's so much like Braveheart and so much like just, just traditional, like, Scottish romantic idea of what Highlanders are like in here. They might take our lives, but they'll never take our trousers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> their war cries are fantastic. Oh, they're so good. And some of those war cries are in their first appearance in Carpe Yagulum as well, but there's no context for them. They just shout them out in the intro, and you're like, who are these people? <laughs> I have um, a question, actually, because um, they call themselves the We Free Men because they've freed themselves from, like, a king or a queen, and they will not be ruled. We mean small, so, like, that means they see themselves as small? Like, I would have thought they would see themselves as normal and everyone else as big. Oh. Like, why aren't they just the free men? And Because they call her a big job and everything, but I guess if they're from fairyland and everything else is big and proportionate to those around them, it's just strange to think of a society of people viewing themselves as not the norm. Well, I, I mean, I guess where they're from, they're used to the fact that there are lots of different kinds of folk. You know, there's there's lots of different species, for want of a better term, of fairy folk. But, like, we don't think of ourselves as smaller in comparison to elephants or giraffes or anything like that. It's, no, but you, you we... You center your own experience. I, that's true, but we don't think of elephants as humans either. Whereas if they said they were free men living in the human world, that might be confusing. Because they're like, but what about these guys? But also it is potentially a reference to an actual Scottish group that previous guest and listener Avril alerted me to, the We Free, which is the nickname of a, a spin-off of the Free Church of Scotland. So they they kind of joined with another church and became like a sort of united church deal. But there were a bunch of people from the original Free Church who didn't want to do that and they were really opposed to it. And they called themselves the We Free. And they've actually as as it turns out, have now become the much bigger and more popular denomination of Presbyterians in Scotland. But at the time, they were a smaller faction, so that's what they called themselves, and notoriously did not like anything that was fun, so they would not have approved of anything that the Feagles like. So Arrow wondered if maybe this was like, you know, a bit of a rude gesture to <laughs> the Wing huh. Free Church of Scotland. Although they don't, they also, it's probably worth noting, they don't like to call themselves that anymore because they're not a small church anymore. But yeah, so I, I, but it's just got a nice ring to it. Oh, it absolutely I, does. It's just as a matter of perspective, it's interesting. Like if they chose to name themselves that, like I know I'm thinking too deeply into it. I know. Mm. I assumed that it was that they called themselves we free men as in W-E free men. And then when humans were interacting with them, if they ever did or bigger people, they were like, aha, the we free men as in the little free men. And then they kind of just adopted it, not realizing it was a pun on their size or something like that. <laughs> so that's nowhere near as intricate a uh, reasoning behind it. But that was just, I guess, what I assumed was that they would call themselves the we free men and people were like, aha, because you're little. <laughs> um, so... And there is also that thing about um, there were a lot more ease around back then when she's looking through like some of her old books. Oh, I loved that so much. That was great. Mm. <laughs> so so it could be that um, too. Exactly. Maybe it was just one of those extra E's that was lying around and attached mm. itself to their name. I mean, what can you do about that if it happens? So Nothing. They're parasitical. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Feeding off the different words and just making them grow at the same time. So. Yeah, I used to just be called Elizabeth. Mm. 
<laughs> I used to That's where I got the extra vowels. That's where I got the extra vowels in my name. There are a few extra E's and things floating around and they yeah. just shoved themselves in there. So. You can't escape them. <laughs> yep. Uh, they're inescapable. Mm. Oh, sorry, they're inescapable. The, um, but yeah, she she manages to talk to them. She finds out more about them. And basically, they, they give her the, the short version of what's going on with them. She doesn't Very know the good. Full story the yet. Very good, short version. Oh, no, that's not what I meant at all. Uh, <laughs> but they, uh, they, they are fairy folk, but they are in trouble. Uh, they need her help. They've been sent to find her by their Kelder. They don't really explain who that is at this stage. And they're worried about the Queen of the Elves, or the Quinn, as they call her, who's coming into the world, because that is a sign that, indeed, their Kelder is getting weaker, because normally her power would keep her away. So they're like, oh, we, we want you to come back with us. But Tiffany's like, well, I want you to help me find my brother. And they kind of make a sort of agreement that that's what's going to happen. But she also convinces one of them, their leader, um, who is called the big man, <laughs> uh, to give her his name, which they are not keen on because, as it turns out, the only thing they're afraid of is lawyers. And they believe that if your name is written down, <laughs> it's bad news for you. You're going to get arrested. Uh, but he's called Rob Anybody, which is <laughs> it's just... A- <laughs> Ah, oh, yeah, uh, I love it. Uh, what a great name. And so, uh, yeah, he, uh, I don't think I fully appreciated that pun until I just said it now, but it's so good. <laughs> but yeah, he, he sort of describes them as they love fighting and thieving. And what else? And fighting and thieving. <laughs> it's just... And drinking, yeah. you've forgotten drinking. Oh, I forgot drinking, yeah, fighting and thieving and drinking. And they've been sent to find the hag, which is their word for a witch, uh, although this is not entirely clear. Yet, and they think that as a grandchild of Granny Aching, that she must have been taught the ways of being a hag by Granny Aching. Um, and she sort of thinks about her granny and is like, but she didn't do any magic. And then she's like, wait a minute, she kind of did. And tells the great story of the Baron's dog, which, mm. oh, it's so good. Where, yeah, the, the Baron's dog kills a sheep, and there's a rule that. That means the dog's got to be put down. The Baron doesn't want to do it. And she's like, well, that's the law of the land around here. If you want to get around it, you've got to pay a price for it, essentially. Um, and she does sort of negotiate that for him, but then says, now I've done this for you. You better remember this. Um, yeah. Did anyone else think when that was happening, my first assumption was that it was actually the wee free men pretending to be a sheep that was inside the um, <laughs> with that story, just because there'd been the earlier one about the bird with them teaching the cat, like teaching the cat not to eat birds by pretending to be a bird and then turning out to be a rather more fighting sort of bird than they used to encountering. <laughs> I just until they talked about how a sheep defending its young would would headbutt and um and be quite strong against a dog i just assumed that she knew the wee free men and the wee free men were in the shed beating up the sheep. dog and pre- oh. yeah biff in the sh- yeah pretending to be a sheep and then that was what it told the dog that it wasn't meant to be you like bye bye <laughs> you scummer yeah yes, exactly yes. uh <laughs> that did not occur to me but i love that that's that's delightful uh, same and i kind of want that to be the case like then they later subbed in the the sheep to be all right uh yeah. I mean, appearances look, you don't want to get butted by a sheep though I can tell you that for free. Now, I, one of the things I love about this is, you know, Tiffany's trying to convince them that she doesn't know any magic, but then she looks at their faces and the, there's this great passage where it says, she looks at hundreds of expectant faces. Some of the feagles had feathers in their hair and necklaces of mole teeth. You couldn't tell someone with half his face dyed dark blue and a sword as big as he was that you weren't really a witch. You couldn't disappoint someone like that. <laughs> I'm like... Uh, is she afraid or is she just sad for them? I don't know. I was a bit like, oh, what do you mean by that exactly, Pratchett? But there's also this weird tension between whether the Knack Knack Figgle are actually blue creatures or they're just covered in blue tattoos. And they absolutely have blue tattoos. Well, the, the Wode people, wasn't that like a thing like back in like ancient England? Were, I, I don't know the history of this, and most of this is based on a really mediocre Kira Knightley movie, so I'm sorry. But like, <laughs> there's a whole thing where they like painted themselves blue with woad flowers or woad that is paint, a thing. and they're very um, tattooed, so I thought that perhaps the tattoos were blue. Yeah, but I think there is a passage that sort of says you couldn't really tell if they were actually blue or if they were completely covered in the tattoos. It's like zebras, like aren't they like the other way around to what you expect? Like their stripes are the white bits and they are black? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. In the illustrated edition, all of the male fecals that you see, they're all just depicted as blue all over. But the Kelda, when you meet her, is not blue. Hmm. 
but Fionn, her daughter, is, so I don't really know what to think. Anyway, she agrees to help them if they'll help her, basically. And so they say, right, well, we'll take you off to see the Kelder. And she leaves a note for her mum and dad, <laughs> which was delightful. Please turn the cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um, they pick her up, like, one under each shoe and carry her because they're so immensely strong and immensely fast, even though they're very small. And the next chapter is called The Green Sea, and it's very evocative. They go through the chalk and all of the green fields where the sheep graze, and it talks a bit more about the background. And this is, it's interesting how much this was a reminder that, that Lanka, you know, very much draws on parts of England, but the chalk even more so is very strongly based on Wiltshire, where, where Pratchett lived, but also parts of northern England as well. There's lots of real stuff, like from the real world, that is incorporated. Like the form of counting that the shepherds use, that's real, that's from um, northern England. And a whole bunch of other stuff about shepherd beliefs, like being buried with a little tuft of wool and stuff like that, that's that's from real life. So it's really interesting to me how much reality creeps into this book, because it certainly feels much more grounded in reality in a weird way, which I guess is important because so much of it is about the difference between reality and dreams. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking the word jigget the whole time. Because of the... <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Uh, it is a great word. What a great nickname too! It just feels like a good nickname, right? Yeah, mm. and accurate, which is perfect for mm. Tiffany. Mm. Yeah, exactly the sort of nickname she would approve of. Any other sort, but why that? So, mm -hmm. mm. yeah. But along the way, she's reminded of the day that Granny died, and we finally find out that that was a year ago, and they buried her in the chalk with a bit of wool. And that it was Tiffany who found her. Mm. Yeah, that was pretty full on, wasn't it? Yeah, and I thought that was described beautifully because it has the whole thing. Because throughout the book, she's questioning quietly if she's a good or a bad person because she like, used her brother as bait. She's not that excited to find him or she wants to find him but she also is resentful of him because he she used to be the baby and she says sort of quietly oh well I have to find him because he's mom's favorite which she knows is true so she's kind of worried that she's not good because she doesn't love her brother or at least she feels like she doesn't love her brother so the when she finds her her grandmother the scene that's described is done really well because they're like the dogs didn't do any whining or any of the typical thing. She just sort of put the house in order and quietly got things done and she never cried for her. But that's not because she wasn't upset. And I just think that was a really good way to underscore that about her character. Mm. I also feel like you really um, feel for her because I think as a reader, you understand that that she's asking those questions at all means that she probably is a good person rather than just assuming that her reaction is totally fine or that any of her reactions are totally fine and that she is a good person just without even questioning that. I feel like if you're questioning whether or not you're a good person, probably a lot of the time you are yeah. to be worried that much about whether your actions match up with what your idea of a good person is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I go with that. And I, I mean, I found that also quite, like it resonated with me personally. So I, my grandfather died when I was quite young and he wasn't that old either. And I remember being sad, but also not really getting it. Like, you know, I'd, he was the first really important person in my life to die. And I didn't see him uh, for a little while before he died. Like, he wasn't sick or anything. He died quite unexpectedly, but I just hadn't seen him for a week or two. And and I was kind of, you know, I was just being a kid when people were readying for the funeral. And I was, you know, mucking about and being normal because I didn't really know how to feel or what to do. And the adults were a bit like, don't you get it? Like, can't you behave like, you know, you grieve it? And, of course, no, because when you're a little kid, it's not, you don't grieve in the same way that adults do. You don't get it. It's the whole, I mean, there's that cliche of going through having animals that die, but that's a very different experience when you live on a farm because there's a lot of animals and they die all the time and you don't get sentimental about it because you can't. I mean, sad, but it's for practical reasons as much as anything else. So I've kind of felt that whole thing with her not crying. Yeah, it rang really true for me for how little kids deal with some of that stuff. I mean, it's different when it's your parents dying and that's like that's obviously a really big deal but yeah with grandparents and, and more distant relatives yeah and arguably the older we get the more homogenized our demonstration of grief is because mm. i would say you learn the things that are expected from people around you from film from all kind of media there are certain touchstones that you are expected to do and i 
not for a moment am I saying that all grief is performative, but I do think that there are certain performative elements that we are taught are essential, otherwise you're not doing it properly. And so it stifles your own personal real response. And you sort of end up with a disconnect between how you feel you should be presenting your grief, and how you are actually experiencing it. So I think there's an element of that because she is experiencing grief and she's still experiencing grief, but she isn't presenting it in the way that the people around her would have done it or that she might think that she's supposed to. Yeah. I think also there's that element where if it's sort of your first experience with grief, you kind of don't know what it's going to mean for your life until the gaps happen where that person would otherwise be. Mm. Um, and maybe in sort of in the future, when, when you have that sort of experience, you kind of jump ahead to knowing, oh, this means they're not going to be here then and then and then, and these situations where I would usually have them is where I would miss them. So you kind of, that can kind of be balled up in one moment in a way that you, if you haven't gone through that experience before, you can't preemptively be like, I'm going to miss them at this point and this point and this point when I need them. Mm. Um, because you haven't had that experience yet. So, yeah, it feels like she kind of misses Granny. Well, she misses Granny, obviously, to start off with, but even more when there are moments where where she would know what to do and mm. or where she could ask her questions and she's not there. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's even – it's sadder in a way too because you get the feeling that this is the first kind of time where she would have mm. had those questions. Like she didn't spend that much time with Granny, and as she talks about as the book goes through and she's having more of these memories, she didn't even really know her that well. They didn't know how to talk to each other. But now she's going through this whole business where it turns out Granny would have been exactly the right person to guide her through it and teach her, and she's not there. So, yeah, it's it's kind of doubly sad for that reason. Mm. Mm. But, look, you know, along the way, not only is she reminiscing, uh, they meet Hamish, one of the Nagmag Fiegel who flies around on the buzzards above the chalk, you know, watching overhead. Tiffany feels another susurration. And a bunch of Grimhounds arrive with some more snow and attack them all. And the Grimhounds are like these awful, like, hellhounds with, like, eyes of flame and teeth of razor blades, I think is how they describe them. And they're awful. And the Nakamak people are fighting them so that Tiffany can run away. But she realizes if she can lure them outside this sort of circle of snow, that they become more real or they have to fit in with the reality around them. And, of course, a being with eyes of flame and teeth of razor blades just going to hurt itself a lot so she easily smacks one over the head with a frying pan but they managed to fight off the grim hounds uh, not without some of the nakmak fiegel dying which is why i found it a little bit interesting that death doesn't show up but it also gives an opportunity to explain their rather unconventional beliefs because mm. they think that they're all already dead and that this is the afterlife because it's so wonderful. There's lots of stuff for them to steal. There's lots of weird beasts for them to fight. They love it. And when they die, they don't really die. They go back to the world where they were alive and have another go. And I thought, what a weird but interesting thing to put in. And I'm not quite sure where that comes from. It was cool though, right? I, I like it as a concept. Yeah, it was great. Seems no more like ridiculous than any other concept of that sort. So it actually kind of surprises me that, that there isn't one that I can immediately identify in real world and be like, oh yeah, like that. <laughs> so yeah. because it does seem like the sort of thing that would be, I mean, I guess it makes as much sense as that's ever going to make. So. Mm. And kind of a nice way to, to live. Because mm. <laughs> I mean, like, this is it. Like, this is the reward. Everything here is great and nothing yeah. to fear, really. Like, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They are pretty fearless. I mean, even when bad things happen, they are kind of just get serious. Mm. But they do sometimes say that they seem fearful of Tiffany. And I, I, I guess that that's maybe a little bit hard to explain under, in this context. But um, it makes sense, though, I guess. I don't know. Um, well, maybe it's that they're not afraid of death because of that, but that doesn't mean they can't be afraid of other things like lawyers or t or small <laughs> child witches. <laughs> so they're afraid of things that they'll have to deal with in this world. They're not afraid of things that would send them out of this world. So Yeah, very fair, very fair. <laughs> and they are conscious of, like, because we well, – I, I tried to – the way I realized that some of them had died was that they were carrying some over their shoulders. And I flipped back pages to be like, did I miss the bit where they died and it was sad? But – they were just matter-of-factly taking the bodies across the boundary so that humans didn't find tiny bones and ask questions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so they're quite Sweet. a practical people, which is, I think, one of the things that sort of is probably a common ground between them and Tiffany. Mm. 
you would ask questions. You'd be like, what's this tiny, tiny skeleton? Yeah. 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 Can't have evidence of that sort of thing. Even on the disc world where everybody knows there's magic mm. and they know that there are dwarves and elves. Although there is this weird, I, I think this is where the tone of this book is a little different because, you know, you've got a bit of that sort of more uh, advanced era of the disc world creeping in here, which we see in the later Ang Morpork books. But there it's so cosmopolitan, everyone just accepts that there's lots of different people and some of them are dwarves and some of them are trolls and some of them are gnomes, right? But here it almost feels like all that fairy tale stuff, we don't believe in that anymore. Like the Baron is outlawed witches and we have traditional beliefs, but we don't we don't worry about we free men. Nobody seems to know about them or think about them or talk about them. But I was trying to picture a kind of who's on a first style conversation where someone comes across one of these tiny skeletons and the person who knows what it is but doesn't want people to catch on is like, oh, it's just really far away. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trick of perspective. Yeah. It was like a dead parrot sketch one. No, it's just, it's just uh, very far away. You can't quite like see how far away. It's a normal size skeleton. That's very funny. Mm. Uh, but anyway, they, they escape the Grim Hounds. They make it to the uh, Nakmak Figgles mound where they live, which is like an old burial mound for ancient kings, much like you have in real world England. Uh, and they occupy the side of it that the kings are not buried in, so that's nice. They don't live amongst the bones. That would be weird and creepy. <laughs> but they uh, they have a big hole in there, and they kind of explain a bit more about what's been going on and reveal that they basically used to work for Granny Aching, or not for her, but with her, and that she would let them have a sheep every now and then, or a ship, as they call them, so that in return they would make sure the other sheep were safe from crows and from foxes, They'd watch out from above. That's why Hamish is flying around on buzzards. And they still do that now, which is why earlier on it, it's alluded to the fact that, you know, it's almost like Granny's still there because lost sheep turn up where her house on wheels used to be because they burned it down, uh, but they left the wheels there. And that's where the lost sheep often turn up and they're safe and sound. And so that's because the Nakmak Fiegel are herding them there um, and they're taking the tobacco that people leave at Granny's old house and keeping it for themselves as kind of a payment and Tiffany's kind of a bit outraged by this, but then she realizes, well, I just didn't really know anything about my grandmother at all, um, which leads her to remember the whole incident where she won the little statue, porcelain statue of a shepherdess in the traditional sort of blue, like very like little Bo Peep style, which she gave to her grandmother, who used to look at it a lot. And she now thinks that was a terrible thing to do. That's not what real shepherds are like. And she probably thought it was dumb. I, I thought that was really interesting because it's like one really childish thing in her memories of herself mm. where she does something really sentimental and, and even a bit, for want of a better term, girly. Like she wins this beautiful little statue and gives it to her grandmother. Possibly with magic because it's supposed to be not a vet, like it's a one in a million chance and the guy's really annoyed that she's managed to throw the hoop over it because you know that oh, yeah. thing where the, the wooden block is usually a bit thicker than the hoops are and it's a perspective thing. So it sounds mm. like maybe she used some of her magic to win it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. That's what I thought. No, I like that. I like that interpretation. Um, but anyway, after discussing this and realizing a bit more of what she didn't know, an older looking Fiegel comes out and plays some mouse pipes, <laughs> more of which we will hear about later. Uh, and she is led into the secret chamber of the Kelder, who is kind of like the queen of the Nakmak Fiegel and likens herself to like a queen in a beehive because she has lots and lots of male children but only one or two female children. She kind of alludes to the fact that maybe there's been others, but you only meet one of her daughters in this who does not like Tiffany <laughs> at all. She's like, no, you can't come in here and do this. But she is dying and her power is waning and she needs someone to take over as Kelder of the clan until another Fiegel can be brought to become the new Kelder. And so she asked Tiffany to do that because she's a hag in their language. She's a witch, so she's capable of doing it. And in return, she'll help Tiffany figure out how to find the queen and get her brother back. And they have a great conversation about the nature of, of witchcraft and how the Kelda knows that Tiffany is a witch. And this is where she talks about first sight and second thought, which is the name of this chapter as well. And it's great. There's a great um, definition of it and how it works. Um, and it's a recurring theme, particularly in British writing, I find, less so in American writing, that people with magical senses or supernatural senses don't so much see things that aren't there whereas they see things that are there and it's more that everyone else is being fooled rather than that someone has a special ability to see things that other people can't see is that they see the things other people won't see like the tardis yeah like the tardis it crops up in everything from 
uh, Doctor Who to Douglas Adams and the idea of the somebody else's problem field. Harry Potter. Uh, Harry yes. Potter. It's in Harry Potter. Yeah, that's right. So it's in lots of things. It's a, it seems like a particularly, and, and maybe like if you know of any examples where um, that has happened in other literature, I'd love to hear about them. But it seems to me particularly a thing that crops up in, in English literature. And maybe that's because it comes from these kinds of stories. Mm. But yeah, there's a sort of a family tree in my edition of the Fields, which is just Kelder, big man, and then a lot of lines with a lot of other <laughs> Fields. <laughs> Um, and actually I was reading this and I was trying to figure out because she kind of talks about how, yeah, all the figures in the clan are her sons, apart from, um, the brothers. guy playing the mouse pipes, mm. who is, yeah, one of her brothers who came with her when she came to become the Kelder of the clan. I couldn't find anything about who her husband was, but then looking at this diagram, it says big man. Does that mean that Rob anybody was the Kelder's husband? I, I thought he was one of her sons and he's the new big man. Because I thought that was, I mean, look, maybe it's not very important, but I think because of what happens when they're talking about the Queen and the Elves later on, it, I was a bit surprised that it wasn't mentioned in some way. Maybe he's died a long time ago and he's the former big man. Like, yeah, that, that would make title. sense. Like, because, yeah. But doesn't he introduce himself as the big man before Tiffany chooses him? So that's... Yeah, back when they first meet on the farm before that's they come confusing. to the mound. Mm. He's the big man. But I think he's the big man in terms of he's in charge. So he's like the he's the leader of the male Fiegels. Like he leads them into battle and stuff. Mm. But the Kelder is still the ultimate authority and guardian of the whole clan. And their mum, mm. for most of them. Mm. She does the great chalks thing where they lick their thumbs and do like a thing. And there's the great moment where Tiffany finally does it mostly because the Kelder's daughter really doesn't want her to. <laughs> I'm like, that was great. Yeah, and you absolutely would. Yeah, yeah. And she's being jealous even though, you know, that's not how it works. Like, she has to go off and be the Kelder of a different clan. She can't, like, marry one of her brothers. And also Tiffany agrees to do it. And, and they're like, you can't do all the duties of being a Kelder. And she's like, oh, yeah, I bet I can. <laughs> I, think, like, I don't <laughs> think you can. I don't think you've thought this through. Uh, and she realizes that she is, in fact meant to marry the big man and like have more fecal children no no she has to choose someone to marry and oh, set a date true, yeah. so like all of the fecals like when when the time comes they they sort of do themselves up a little bit yeah that's right and but i mean they all the they're all back. pretty much saying no he's gonna come on she's gonna choose rob anybody but but they're all like yeah slicking their hair back <laughs> gets flowers like one of them has like a little bunch of flowers and that's cute and uh, they have an opportunity that cause she just goes outside to, for a bit of a breath of fresh air because everyone's really sad because the Kelda actually dies after she's mm -hmm. made this deal. Um, and she talks to the um, guy playing the mouse pipes who she discovers is the clan's Gonigal, <laughs> which is such a cheeky name because also his name is William. He's William the Gonigal. So it's clearly a reference to um, oft described worst poet in the world, uh, William McGonigal of Scotland, <laughs> um, who... <laughs> Who, yes, uh, so we'll, we'll come back to him because there's a few more references to him. But anyway, he's the Kelda's brother who came with her and he's really sad. And I, I found, I, well, I found that really sad actually, that moment where he's talking about how, you know, the Kelda brings some of her brothers so that she's around some people that she knows when she joins a new clan. Um, but then, you know, she gets married and she has all these children and she's not so lonely anymore. And Tiffany immediately says, well, it sounds like it would be pretty lonely for you. And he's like, well, you're pretty smart. Once we get a new Kelder, I'm, I'm going to ask if I can go back home because I want to be buried in the lands of the clan where I grew up. Grew up. And you're like, wow, that's like, there's some, there's some pathos there. <laughs> that was sad. Um, but she also uh, hears from uh, Hamish from up above again, who tells her that he thinks he knows where the things are coming from. And he points off into the distance and Tiffany notices there's some standing stones there. But then she goes back inside. That's where everybody's like, oh, you've got to marry somebody. Who's it going to be? And she, she sort of agrees that it'll be Rob anybody, but then cleverly gets out of it with that old fairy tale trick of going, oh, I've got to set a date. Um, okay, it's when the little bird that's scraping its beak on the mountain every day wears the mountain down to nothing. Uh, again, something that's been used in Doctor Who, but it's such a good image. Oh, it's brilliant. It's like a Prometheus bird. Yeah. I love that the Nack McFee, like a few of them decide, oh, it's like, oh, but we could help the bird wear it down quicker. And Rob's like, no, 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 it has to be the little bird. It must be the bird. So. <laughs> you heard what she said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> Rob catching on quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is also, by the way, um, where she meets one of my favorite other figural characters. Um, not as big as medium sized jock, but bigger than wee jock jock, <laughs> uh, who is the apprentice Gonegal for the clan. <laughs> And he, like, talks about how there's only so many Fiegel names, so they have to add all these qualifiers onto them, <laughs> which was so funny. And he keeps, like, politely correcting her every time she gets it slightly wrong. Mm. It's also just a really fun name to read really fast. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's good. And I love that Pratchett never shortens it. Every time he appears in the text, his full name is used. But how <laughs> could you? Great. Like, how could you shorten it? Yeah, well, I guess then that's Then it would be point. referring to someone else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and she never gives him a nickname either that's shorter. So, yeah, I liked that. You can't give someone else a nickname without their permission. Oh. Or you shouldn't. Is that how it works? I've been given many nicknames and no one ever asked me about any of them. <laughs> Maybe I just give off a really scary vibe because like, people call me Liz and then they go, oh, is, it, is that okay? And I'm like, mm, I'm not going to like kill you. But I think it's because you write Elizabeth on, on so many things. People wonder if they're allowed. I guess so. Just got a lot of respect for you, Liz, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably it too. Uh, but yeah, they gather themselves together now that they've sorted out the issue of being married and everyone's quite impressed, particularly the Gonagall is quite impressed at how she deals with this. Uh, and they head off to the stones to see if they can find the way. She's only got the clue that the Kelda gave her was just to find the place where the time doesn't fit. And that's a pretty vague clue. Uh, but they head off to the stone circle and she panics a bit because she can't figure out what to do. And then she like tries to demand that the Gonagall helps her. And he's like, that's not how it works. You don't order me about. You can figure it out. And he's sort of initially quite indignant and doesn't put up with her nonsense. And it's I kind of liked that scene because up until that point, Tiffany had so rarely done something that was that felt really childish mm. and age appropriate. And and I get that that's what Pratchett's going for is that, you know, she's wise beyond her years and she is that kind of very serious, practical person. But um, it was nice to see her let out a bit of that childishness and get put back in her place and say, no, that's not how it works. And, and I really love that he actually says, you know, you're just crying for sweeties in a reference to what her brother always does that annoys her so much. So I thought that was great. And then uh, eventually, though, she does figure it out. She's sort of looks at the standing stones the right way and figures out how to step through them, um, which is basically you have to do it with your eyes closed so that you're not fooled into going straight past the gateway. And um, I love this because in the illustrated edition, there are several pages where there's a sort of a fold-out flap and there's a different illustration on the inside than on the outside. And they use it when the feagles are being summoned. So there's Tiffany sitting in the dairy uh, with no fegals and then you open the flap and then there's fegals everywhere and similarly there's one for when she's walking through the gateway so there's one where she's like got her eyes closed and she's got her hands held out so she can walk through it and then when you open it she's stepping through the other side and it's all snowy on the other side and it's it's really cool strong narnia vibes too because it's all winter yeah exactly mm. But never Christmas. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the, and and as many sweets as you want, uh, which is the theme of both stories. So I think clearly that's probably you know a purposeful allusion there. But I also really like his justification of why it's winter there, which is that um, it's not properly real. And there's a very strong analog behind the way he describes this in the book, where whatever you're looking at is only as real as it needs to be to seem real like at the appropriate distance. And so it's just like in a video game where the engine will conserve resources in the computer by only rendering in lots of detail stuff that you can see close up, stuff that's far away that you can't see the detail on anyway is just rendered as like a, you know, if it's a building, it's just a flat square. And then when you get closer, it'll like add texture so you can see windows and then it'll add like the interior of the building if you can see inside the windows and stuff like that. Um, and and that's what fairyland is like. And uh, Tiffany has the thought, well, if you can't be real all the time, snow's quite useful because it's just white stuff. It's real easy to draw. Um, and I thought that was very clever. It was definitely one of my favourite paragraphs, the paragraph about how the trees weren't really – she got the feeling they were becoming more trees as she was putting her attention to them. So they yeah. were just blobs in the distance, and it wasn't just that they looked like blobs. They really were blobs until she got closer. And then the details were filled in, and they were trying to look as tree-like as possible because they were under observation. So it was... yeah. yeah. 
there's um there's a passage like that in it's I think I can't remember if it's Mort or Reaper Man's one of the earlier death books where that's what death's domain is like. Because like, there's mountains off in the distance, but the way they're described is like they're obviously very pixelated. Um, and I think Mort, I think it's in Mort, because I think Mort sort of wonders if he went up to look at them whether they would still look kind of not quite proper, <laughs> or whether they would get more real if he got close. Bring your wikiality with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they get almost immediately attacked uh, on the other side by a much bigger pack of grim hounds, but this time the Feagles are not worried at all because the Gonagal is with them, and he sort of just very calmly, and I love this, like, it's just such a great tropey badass move that there's, like, something horrendous happening, and the person who's, like, knows how to deal with it just very calmly getting their gear ready, and everyone else is like, what the, what, what's going on? And he's just unscrewing one set of pipes and screwing the other pipes on, and then he plays... And it's a really high pitched sound that the grim hounds can't stand and they all fall over and can't like coordinate themselves. And then when they do get back up and he stops, they run away. And it's just, oh, great battle piper. I love it. And they find a trail of uh, like kind of like jelly babies, effectively. Along the way, Tiffany learns a bit more about the history of the Macnac Fiegel. They used to work for the Queen, thieving stuff from other worlds. But the Fiegels have a code. We said it's no right to steal an old lady's only pig or food from them as dinner hand enough to eat. A feagle has no worries about stealing a golden cup from a rich big job you can, but taking away the... And then it goes from their vernacular into Tiffany kind of understanding what they want. They felt ashamed of taking stuff from people who couldn't afford to lose it. And so they said, no more, we're not going to do it. And they ended up escaping from fairyland and becoming independent and calling themselves we free men, which is just a nice background for them. Yeah. I kind of love it. They're honourable. Yeah, they are. They are. Honourable thieves. Yeah. And I, I kind of like how their origins are still kind of mysterious because as we find out as we explore Fairyland more, nobody who lives there is actually from there. She's stolen all the people and all the things there from other worlds, not just the human world, but other ones as well. And so it's not clear where they come from. Like they might have had their own world at one point, but somehow they came to end up in Fairyland and work for the Queen. Uh, and then they escaped. So, yeah, I, I like that they have this long history, but it's not necessarily the entire definitive history as well. And how far, like, how many generations ago was it? Like, is it in living memory or? Hard to know, isn't it? Because the time works so differently. Mm. But it seems clear that it's at least centuries because. Kelders have done whole families. Yeah. Mm. And the, I mean, the Kelder of the Chalk Hill clan, which is this group, says she's been their Kelder for something like 78 years or something. They've at least been on the Discworld for 80 years or more. So, yeah, it's probably a very long time. Mm. Mm. But, you know, in the way of fantasy worlds, like they, there seems to be hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of history where things haven't changed very much until fairly recently, which is, which is pretty much how you have to assume all fantasy worlds work. Oh, very convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So should we um, rocket through, what is it, basically, fecal inception so we can get to questions? <laughs> Yes, yes. It is very much a fecal inception, but it is great. Tiffany manages to trip into a dream, which is a trap set by a creature called a drome. Um, and she has that whole, uh, I'm going to wake up at home kind of vibe. But even in the dream, she almost immediately starts thinking, oh, she woke up and it's all a dream. That's the worst ending to a story ever and starts to figure out it's not real by herself. But then the fecals break into the dream, kill the drome and free her and explain what's going on. Don't have the porridge. Yeah, don't eat in there. That's such a staple of fairy stories. Don't eat any food that they offer you or you're trapped there forever. And that goes all the way back, not just to fairy stories, but Greek mythology with Persephone and the pomegranate seeds that she eats in the underworld. So that's a that's a really old trope of fairy stories. It's so gorgeous, though, that the dream knows that the best way to possibly trap Tiffany is going to be an amazing array of cheeses. <laughs> yes. That's right, because they get out of that dream. They meet Roland, who is the Duke's lost son, who's been in Fairyland this whole time. And then they get trapped in, yeah, this other dream of a lavish party where she's almost tempted by the cheeses. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and then she realizes that the drome is disguised as Roland and cuts his head off. But when she gets out, the Fiegels are not there. They're on their own. Although I don't want to miss out the bit where in between they meet the tiny little flying fairies with wings that Tiffany kind of had hoped would be proper fairies and they're awful creatures that bite everyone and then not as big as medium-sized jock but bigger than wee jock jock reads his awful poetry in an even even more direct allusion to William McGonagall and that like scares them off. That was so great. I love that. Oh, no, a tree. That's the thing. Oh, no, a tree. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's one of my favourite comments. Uh, so good. Mm. So good. Yeah, the Feagles get into that dream to try and help her, but they get left behind when she escapes it. They get left and behind or they herself. stay behind? Oh, well, yeah, there's a bit of contention there, isn't there? Because there's a lot of drinks in that dream. But she eventually makes her way into the summer dream of the Queen of the Elves, which is made by four tamed drones that she has. And that's the painting that she saw earlier. That's where all those creatures are from. And she finds Wentworth there. He's sitting in a pile of sweets, having a tantrum because there's too many sweets for his brain to deal with. Which was so, <laughs> so, so funny. He can't eat them all. But it's totally how little kids' brains works, like really yeah. little kids. They just can't deal with the choice. It's It reminded me, if you've ever seen, I think we've talked about this on the podcast before, the marshmallow test. And when you hear recordings of kids like having to sit there and not eat the marshmallows, <laughs> it's, so, it's just like that. They're but they'll like, get two marshmallows later and be fine. Yeah, but they find it so hard. And later um, is forever away, so. Mm, that's true. You can't conceptualize it. You could be having a marshmallow right now, so. Mm. Mm. Better a marshmallow in the hand than a marshmallow in a, yeah. In a packet somewhere else in another room that may never eventuate. Exactly. True. But yeah, she finds Wentworth, she grabs him, she confronts the queen who is also there, and as she's talking with the queen, she's reminded of a story where, uh, and this is kind of a payoff for the earlier story about the Baron's dog, where there was a woman who was not quite right, and she steals someone's baby, but she doesn't do it maliciously. She just kind of does it because, like, oh, other women have babies. I feel like I should have one. And the punishment for stealing a child is like death, or I think, or something horrible. But everyone sort of is like, well, that's the law, and it is an awful thing, but also maybe we should, this doesn't seem quite right. And uh, Granny Aching shows up at the trial and sort of reminds the Baron he's supposed to be lenient like she was with his dog. So there's that whole payoff for that as she's encountering the Queen, which I thought was nice because it sort of, it was weird. I don't know. How did you feel about that story, actually? Because now that I think about it, I did have some conflicting thoughts about it. So um, I was kind of like, oh, wow, this is like a Miss Marple moment because you know how Miss Marple is always relating the criminal back to someone from St. Mary Mead. They're like, oh, well, this murder happened, but it's kind of like when like Lady such and such, who used to help with the flowers at the vicarage, took them and did this, and I just extrapolated that to this situation, and I found it kind of lent a degree of empathy to what would normally be a two-dimensional villain. Like, Hmm. this person steals babies and doesn't know how to care for them. Like, she gives them everything they want, not everything they need, but she doesn't Hmm in my opinion, do it maliciously. Like she probably genuinely wants to have children in a nice one, thinks she's doing the right thing. Like she's not a hero. She's not a good character. She is a villain, but she's not a evil villain is yeah. what, what I thought the story mm-hmm. did to this. Like gave her some context. And that was showing that Tiffany also understood that context as well. Not that, mm-hmm. But she ultimately goes on to do lots of bad things and she's not in the right, but there's, it's not just being cruel for cruelty's sake. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, okay. Children can sometimes have quite black and white ideas of what role people are playing or of characters or the villain. And the so I I think like it's another of those ways of showing that Tiffany sees some of the shades of grey that another child might not in that circumstance or that she is a bit wise beyond her years and that she's able to have compassion for a villain through what, I guess, through what Granny Granny, I keep on going to say acting, and I know it's not acking. I know it's aching, but some, uh, somehow I worked out at the start that I was going to be pronouncing it acking in my head, and that seems because you read it in a book on, and you didn't hear it out loud. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it happens so, to all of us. <laughs> I feel like it's an example of her showing compassion that a lot of children wouldn't have in that circumstance. The same way as she did at the start with the idea of a witch. She didn't mm-hmm. just take the story at surface value that the witch was evil because this in the story. And so she's kind of demonstrated earlier in that story and then in the granny aching situation. And then now she's able to apply that to a real world situation, which is maybe kind of digging a bit too into it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And I I think, you know, she also is able to see the difference between the two situations as well in that the queen is malicious. Like she's not taking the children to harm them, but she is taking them because she feels like she's entitled to them. Like she's better than other people Mm. and she gets what she wants and what other people want doesn't enter into it. So she is selfish to an extreme degree. The queen knows she's causing harm and she just doesn't really care because it conflicts with what she wants. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's also the flashback is another way of showing how, as it comes across later, Granny is always there for her. Like she might be gone, but her presence is still around. So like that story is her grandmother's empathy or understanding of a situation coming through and applying to a current day situation where she actually isn't physically there. Yeah. But yeah, it's, Tiffany has this face off with the queen where she just sort of says, you're, you're Nicholas Cage. No, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm John Travolta and this is the plot reveal of this book. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she just basically says, you're the worst. And, and then runs away, but doesn't really know how to escape. And of course it's a dream. So the dream just leads her back again, but then she hears the voice of one of the Nakmak figgles and realizes where it's coming from. Now, in the original picture, the fairy fellas master stroke, there's a fairy who's got a big hammer and he's trying to crack a nut. And this is happening in this dream reality as well. And so she realizes that's where the Fiegel's voices are coming from. They're trapped inside the nut. So she gets Roland to smash it while she distracts the queen. And all the Fiegel's burst out. They fight all the other fairies off. And they manage to escape from the summer dream. But the queen is... Very angry. She sends a whole bunch of nightmares after them, which are much worse than any of the things that have chased them before. And there's an amazing illustration of them in the illustrated edition, which is kind of unsettling because they're all bits of different animals all mashed together and they're kind of gross and horrible. But she has an idea because the Fiegels want to fight the nightmares. She's like, you're not going to win. Here's what we're going to do. And she spots a drone in the trees. And she's like, right, we're going into a dream. We're going to hide there. She's trying to recreate a dream that she's had a lot of times, which is uh, a dream based on a story that Granny Aiken used to tell her about the jolly sailor on her jolly sailor tobacco. They're in a boat and they're trying to reach a lighthouse. There's a huge whale that comes for them. But Tiffany's like, it's okay, we're going to be safe because I know how this story goes. The jolly sailor is going to come and the whale's going to chase him. And that does happen. And they make it to the lighthouse with much like arguing about whether a whale is a fish or not. Although this does contain, and we'll come back to this when we get to my favorite bits at the end. It's got one of my favorite bits in it. But they get to the lighthouse. They realize the way to escape is to go through the lighthouse door. The Fiegels insist on going first, <laughs> smash a bunch of stuff up, drink some of the lighthouse uh, fuel, <laughs> which is not a good idea. Uh, and then just as they're about to escape, the water starts draining away from around the lighthouse. They all get a bit distracted. It means it's a and- tsunami. Yeah, but it's a trap from the Queen because she reveals all these sunken ships and the Fiegel's like, oh, look, sunken treasure. Like, we're thieves. We want to steal it. And Tiffany can't convince him to come back in time before, yes, the water all rushes back as a tsunami. And she realizes she can't reach them. Wentworth and the Fiegel's are all down near where the sea is coming back. And she's up by the lighthouse with an unconscious Roland. She's like, I can't reach them. Like, if I go, I'm just going to die. The only reasonable thing for me to do is to escape and take Roland with me because I can at least save him. So she does, and she ends up back in the Queen's Domain where she can see the door back into the real world, and she goes through it, and then she goes, oh, wait a minute, what have I done? Like, I've left everyone behind. They haven't made it, but now I can't find the door back, and then the Queen is there. You failed. And this next bit, and this is like the second last chapter, the Queen just really lays into a Tiffany and just tells her you've failed, you're not even a real human. You don't care about your brother. You were just trying to get him back because you felt like he belonged to you and he didn't belong to me. And just preying on all of her insecurities and fears. And I was really, I don't know about you, that really got me that bit. I was like, oh, no. It was harsh. Yeah, and it was just relentless as well because it was just her things articulated by someone else, which is the nightmare, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was full on. It was very emotionally astute villaining. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of liked it because it showed that the Queen wasn't just this sort of unthinking stealer of stuff into dreams. Like, she's manipulative and awful. Like, she's gross. She is malicious and she is a villain. Uh, and I, Yeah, I liked, I liked that. Tiffany is kind of beaten down by these words. She falls over in the snow and the Queen is bringing fairyland to the real world. Like the the snow is encroaching, there's a storm, there's icy winds and Tiffany's going to freeze to death. Like this is not the normal winter of the chalk. This is a supernatural winter brought from fairyland and it's going to kill her. But she's saved because she kind of taps into this, I don't know how you describe it, because it's in some ways I felt like this was a little bit of a, Where did this come from, from Pratchett? But in other ways, it felt really justified because basically what she does is tap into the sort of way that she belongs to the land, that the Aching family has always belonged to this land in the same way that Granny did. 
and summons the spirit of her grandmother's dogs, Thunder and Lightning, as actual Thunder and Lightning, who herd the storm away. So they get rid of the supernatural storm from Fairyland. The spirit of her grandmother explicitly appears to her. And not only does she appear, she appears wearing the dress from the porcelain figurine that Tiffany thought her grandmother hated. But actually, it turns out she probably thought it was great. And I, there's so many different ways you could interpret this because it's not really explicitly stated what's going on. Then that also kind of releases the Feagles who try to come to her aid. But then the fairy queen's not having any of that. She's like, I know what'll get you and summons fairy lawyers, which I thought was so good. And then this is the Toad's moment to shine because we realize he's been dropping all these little weird sayings. And during it, I was like, oh, he's going to turn out to be a lawyer because it was very much lawyerese. But I'm like, but how is that going to, I don't know, does that mean the Feagles are going to hate him? But actually it means he's the hero of the piece right at this moment because he talks back to the fairy lawyers and outlawyers them which gives the Feagles free reign to kind of get in there and have a fight. And once that ploy doesn't work, the Queen's like, all of you, be gone. And she banishes them all. And it's just her and Tiffany again. And this is where we have this final confrontation between Tiffany and the Queen. And Tiffany again taps into that power uh, where she sort of talks about how she's awake. And there's a, there's like a one line in there. And she says, you know, I'll never feel like this again. Uh, and then she's frightening the queen because she's tapping into this power of the land. I'll never feel as tall as the sky and as old as the hills and as strong as the sea. I've been given something for a while and the price of it is that I have to give it back. So she's tapping into this power of the chalk and she can only do it once. And there's just a few, like, I mean, is it the spirit of granny that is providing this? Is it the fact that the aching family belong to the earth here and vice versa? And that's the connection that she's drawing on. Or is it that she's like waking up and being real? What, aching up? Aching up, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's hard to say because why isn't it repeatable? Is it because it's the first time she's realizing it? Or if it's because, yeah, it's her grandmother's spirit or something like that? Well, she also says like you couldn't live like that all the time because she's got this like, like the way that she's looking at the world around her means everything is overwhelming because everything is, is super real. Because there's also that whole thing of, like, they've talked about how witches can't grow on chalk, but um, chalk is what breeds flint, which is, like, really hard rock. And I get that Tiffany is supposed to be the flint, which implies that everyone else is soft chalk around her. But mm. at the same time, when she's tapping into things, is like, is her exhaustion because she's tapping into the softness and then suddenly taps into the hardness? I thought maybe that was possibly something, but, yeah. Maybe that's mm, nothing. Yeah. No, maybe, maybe. I mean, I guess I felt like there's a lot of things that are set up and paid off in this book really, really well. And I th I think for me, I didn't feel like this was as set up as it could have been. That's why it's just sort of glossed over me. I was kind of like, oh, yeah, now now that battle's done, I think. Mm. After the lawyers and everything, I'm like, yep, cool, we're good. Now we're on to the, the cool reunion. But, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, like she, she defeats the queen. She smacks the queen across the face and says, get out of here, you. You don't belong here. And she goes back to fairyland, although she's not happy about it. And then Tiffany closes the door, but she's aware that it's not totally sealed and maybe it could be opened again. And the Feagles come back from where they've been trapped and they're like, oh, can we go off and we've got some stuff to steal? So they kind of head off to do some other stuff. They've got, they've got business to attend to. And they got a lawyer. They got a lawyer on their side now, yeah, so they can do whatever they want. <laughs> and this is where, and I didn't know if this was going to happen in this book, but this is where we finally meet some familiar characters because Miss Tick comes back on a broomstick and she's riding shotgun, I guess, <laughs> for Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax is with her as well, although she's not called Granny Weatherwax here. She's only referred to as Mistress Weatherwax, which mm. I thought was interesting. Uh, there's only room for one granny on the chalk, apparently. <laughs> But yeah, they turn up. Nanny Og just sort of sits down and has a bit of a, a grumble about having flown all this way for nothing, <laughs> but then just watches with amusement as Granny Weatherwax kind of, does she, I mean, what's she doing? Like she's using magic to figure out what's happened and getting the whole story without Tiffany having to tell her. She probably like borrowing like from every, every animal around the area. Can she do that with her borrowing or is that just a transfer? Well, maybe. It was much more flashy than most of what she does. But I think it's fitting because like, by the time you get to Carpe Jugulum, which is the, the last mainline witch's book, which happens before this, it's all about how much power she's got and chooses not to use. And here there's this series of flashes and she just knows what's happened. 
but she's really impressed with Tiffany, basically. And Tiffany talks back to her and she lets her do it and goes, yeah, you're a witch, but you're not quite a proper witch yet. Like, you still have a lot of stuff to learn. And when you're old enough and you're ready, come and find a proper witch to teach you. Uh, and this is where they talk about how a witch should have an actual profession. And Tiffany's one is clearly going to be cheese making. Um, but, you know, that Nanny and Granny don't really have their other professions because their profession is watching the edges and watching for stuff like this, which is why they've turned up to deal with it. But they're like, oh, you've already done it. Okay, great. Props to you. Respect. Saved us some time. And uh, Granny, in, in a scene that's very reminiscent of uh, Masquerade, where she makes the mask for um, Super Opera Man in that book, she does the same thing for Tiffany. She constructs like a psychological witch's hat, which he gives to her, um, mm-hmm. which she can feel as if it's real, uh, and which helps her to remember how to be a witch. And then she gets reunited with her dad mm. after the witches leave. And Roland takes all the credit. Well, he says he didn't take the credit. He just let his dad assume that he was the... Well, he didn't let him. He he does say he tries to tell them no, but they won't believe it. And that is a theme I'm throughout. Sure, he thinks that, that mm. people. It's a thing like people don't believe children, but also I feel like he's very happy to take the credit based on how he acts later on. Like he's mm. a bit of an uppity twerp still. If he tried, I don't believe he tried particularly hard. To no. be honest, so yeah, no. And look, she still puts him in his place and says, "I don't care about the credit, but you better remember this when you take over as Baron." Because I'll still be here. And even if I'm not here, someone will be here keeping an eye on you. Mm. And you're like, yeah, you tell him. And then she gets the figures to fill out the buckets and he's all freaked out. Yeah, I didn't know. I, you know, it didn't affer- when I first read that passage, I was like, is she doing actual magic? That was quick. And then it's the figures. I'm like, oh, she fooled me as well. <laughs> Crivens. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, um, you know, she's starting the journey of changing the people on the chalk's attitude to witches by putting this stamp on the butter that has a witch flying on a broomstick with a, a moon, which is really cool, I thought. Excellent use of herdology. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the book. Very good. Which is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, are there any things we haven't... Uh, well, <laughs> I missed something there, didn't I? Uh, are there any things we haven't covered that people want to say about the book before we get on to our favourite bits and questions from listeners? I think mine kind of ties in with like a favorite quote. I'm not going to read it exactly, but I do like how early on it talks about how she's sort of this normal looking and she's got brown hair and brown eyes. And in stories, people with brown hair and brown eyes are usually background figures. It's only if you have red hair and green eyes or a blonde hair that you are the protagonist. And as someone with brown hair and brown eyes, I was like, yes, that's absolutely true. You never see yourself illustrated as the, as the key figure in anything. Hmm. As a fellow brunette, I salute you. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, as a ginger of the male persuasion, we're, we're never the heroes of stories either. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like this is like a book for all of us because it is about a brown-haired, brown-eyed resident and also not to call you a fegal, but um, anyway, so. <laughs> I will accept that mantle with great pride. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. No, if I, 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 I couldn't be a fegal, but I'm... I wish. You could, be I wish. The, you could be one of the ones that doesn't, like, do all the grumpy stuff. <laughs> could be a gonagall, maybe, and yeah. do really bad poetry. Yeah, or play the mouse pipes. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. Look, I'm the wrong kind of Celt, right? My family's mostly Irish. I mean, they're Scots-Irish, but that's okay. We're all the same if you go back far enough, right? I so, don't think you're allowed to say that. I could say that about Celts. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> and we're not the same, but there's a lot of there's a commonalities between the different Celtic cultures. I mean, the, I, we do have tartans in Ireland, and we do play bagpipes sometimes. There's bagpipes in a lot of places, surprisingly. Like it, it's a surprisingly common instrument, and just exists in a lot of different forms. That's true. Hmm. I enjoyed that. And look, you know, the mock Scottishness of them is a lot of fun. Reading their dialogue is great. I, I freely confess that whilst reading this book, I read parts of it out aloud to myself just <laughs> so I could try doing the accent. It was a lot of fun. Oh, which reminds me, I did promise Avril I would read a bit of William McGonagall poetry just to give you a taste of where the inspiration for the Gonagalls comes from. He famously wrote a lot of very bad poetry, but probably his most famously bad one is the Tay Bridge disaster about a a train crash where a um, bridge collapsed when a train was going over it. Actual tragedy, terrible. But the poem he wrote about it 
is horrendous. I'll read you the first stanza. <clears throat> Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, alas, I am very sorry to say that ninety lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. <laughs> Isn't this a BG song? <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> It's not, it's not good. No, it's not a BG song. There's a lot of, so- look, any time a comedy band want to do a song in a Irish style, particularly, and to be fair to the Scots, William McGonagall was Irish. Uh, he just lived in Scotland. Um, Thank you. But there's always, yeah, a, a song about a disaster. But he also has one called The Famous Tay Whale, which I can't imagine didn't inspire some of the Jolly Sailor sequence. But uh, yeah, look, just, oh my God, it's terrible poetry. Anyway, so that's that's where the Gonagall comes from. He's been lampooned a lot, uh, notably by the goons. There's a famous Monty Python sketch about a Scot who writes poetry that's really awful, but really he's just asking people for money, which is, again, that really terrible old stereotype of Scottish people supposedly being very tight with money. But yeah, that's where that comes from. I just really needed to read that. Oh, that's lovely. Um, we're thinking I'm about I'm really that. glad that you did. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's terror so bad. I kind of want that embroidered and like up on my wall. Yeah. It was one of a couple of things that really, not every Pratchett book, but there's sometimes there's very Adamsy bits or things that remind me of The Hitchhiker's Guide. And in this book, I was particularly reminded of the Vogons a couple of times because there's the really awful poetry used not as a torture device in this case, but as a, you know, a weapon. But then there's also... The Dromes, who, the way they're described, like sitting around on their home planet, surrounded by the smashed shells of like crabs and stuff that they've eaten, is very reminiscent of what Vogons are supposed to be like on their own planet in the Hitchhiker's books. And in fact, there's again, you know, there's so many good illustrations in the illustrated edition. I'll, I'll link in the show notes to the illustrator's website because he's got a lot of the illustrations up on there. But there's this beautiful illustration of the Dromes home world. Drone world. Which is, yeah, the drone world, uh, which is all horrible and red and they're gross and lumpy. Uh, does anyone have any favorite bits they wanted to read out or share? So I feel like the one where Tiffany is talking about how she started questioning whether the witch was really the villain mm. is pretty great. So why do you want to be a witch, Tiffany? It had started with the good child's book of fairy tales. Actually, it had probably started with a lot of things, but with the stories most of all. Her mother had read them to her when she was little and then she'd read them to herself. And all the stories had, somewhere, the witch. The wicked old witch. And Tiffany had thought, where's the evidence? So, yeah, that was probably one of my my favourites. And then (laughs) it goes into all of the reasons why the way that witches or anyone else in any of those stories were presented was obviously not realistic in any way, and it's just such a great (laughs) example of how Tiffany sees the world. So, it's great. Yeah, Yeah. that is great. Good insight. I, look, there's there's only a couple of bits that I haven't already talked about. One I alluded to, which is when Tiffany kind of accepts who she is, when she gets joyfully angry while she's correcting Wentworth in the boat in the Jolly Sailor dream. She sort of comes to her senses about herself. She says, yes, I'm me. I am careful and logical and I look things up I don't understand. When I hear people use the wrong words, I get edgy. I am good with cheese. I read books fast. I think and I always have a piece of string. That's the kind of person I am. And that's... I think it's so important because she has that moment of realization, but also later in the book, it's that aspect of her that the queen is really poking at and going, oh, you think you're so good because you've always got a piece of string. And yeah, I really enjoyed that. I also really like, there's a great footnote right at the start where it describes how Miss Tick operates as a witch. Uh, One of which is people say things like, listen to your heart, but witches learn to listen to other things too. It's amazing what your kidneys can tell you. (laughs) That's very practical advice. Um, But also she's described as a misfortune teller. And there's a footnote about that as well. Ordinary fortune tellers tell you what you want to happen. Witches tell you what's going to happen, whether you want it to or not. Strangely enough, witches tend to be more accurate, but less popular. (laughs) Which I thought was great. The kid great way to sum that up. It's interesting because I think, and I could be very wrong, but I know in Chinese massage, different parts of you are supposed to be connected to different organs, and I think that ears are supposed to be connected to kidneys. Oh, right. But I could be wrong. <laughs> I have to look that up, but um, I think they might be. There's a different thing, like if you massage different parts of the feet, it's supposed to be good for different parts, of, like different specific organs. So there's kind of uh... I did actually have one, very quick one. 
which is about how her dad always says that he's aching all over. And she goes, um, they didn't have to be funny. They were father jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a tradition. A good literal one. Yeah, that mm. was good. That was good. Well, look, we got so many great questions from all of you listening, so we want to get into those. Shall we Shall we kick them off? Yeah, all right. So this one's from Rin Betancourt via Facebook. Who would you like to see to play Tiffany in real life, and who would play the wee free man? Oh, I love a good casting question. We haven't done this for a while. Yeah, and I don't know who any actors are. <laughs> uh, What's well, tricky, because you need someone who's nine years old. I think you'd have to find an ingenue. Like, it'd have to be somebody new who was amazing. Um, I mean, it could be the person who plays the like who plays Sabrina the Teenage Witch, who played um, Sally in Mad Men, would have been great. But now she is like twenty. Too old. Well, I mean, that means she can play someone as young as like what fourteen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's how television works, mm-hmm. isn't it? But yeah, someone like her, I think she got a mm. real sort of strength. There's also Daphne Keene, who played the young clone of Wolverine in the movie Logan and has gone on to be Lyra in the His Dark Materials TV series. Mm. And again, she's probably slightly too old, but I mean, you're going to have to cast someone older. You're not going to get somebody who's nine years old who's going to be able to play Tiffany the way that she's written. How old was Anna Paquin when she won her Oscar for the piano? She was pretty young. Uh-huh. Yeah, good question. I'm not suggesting Anna Paquin. Um, <laughs> we need a time <laughs> that would be machine. stretching it a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with the We Free Men, I think that's a cool one because can you just imagine the ensemble cast of like United Kingdom actors that you could put together for that? That would be amazing. That you could get all of the theater guys, like all of all of the big ones, and shoot him. <laughs> yeah, because they'd be. I guess they'd be played in motion capture and be done in CGI, right? Hmm. Mm. Or is it like one person playing all of them? Or like, yeah, I mean, there's lots mm. of opportunities. For some reason, I picture it as a live action one, but with tiny little animated We Free Men, which would probably look terrible and is, but yeah. Depends on how it was done, yeah. though, I think. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, it could be good. I mean, you know, they've made a Smurfs film now, so we need the antidote. <laughs> it was the redhead guy, like the wildling from Game of Thrones, the one who really liked Brienne of Tarth. Like, he'd. He's basically oh, yes. a big fegal. Like, oh yeah, okay. It's true. Like he essentially already is the character, but that, that character is just <laughs> that. So I mean, I'd want him. So he could actually play all of them. Really, he could do the voice for all of them mm. and just have them portrayed by di- different little stop motion animation. Mac McFeagles. Yeah, I think I think you'd have mm. to cast uh, James McAvoy as one of them as well. That's and, true. And um, and I'd want you and McGregor in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. I'd like, I'd like, yeah. You and McGregor as like the as the McGonagall. Yeah, as the McGonagall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he can do a good older person voice because he's really practiced at doing a really good Alec Guinness impression. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then he could also be the young McGonagall as well. He could do both. Can you imagine the casting call and just getting a whole array of actors to stand for to um, step forward and say Crivens? <laughs> just one after another, Crivens, Crivens, Crivens. And I assume it is Crivens and it's not meant to be Crivens or something and I'm mispronouncing it in my head again. No, no. But yeah, Crivens. It's Crivens. a very old-fashioned swear word. It's not that strong a swear word either. But it's mm. it's very – nobody uses it anymore. I like it. I like that it's, it's now mostly associated with the fecals, which is really good. <laughs> This is one from Sven via Discord. A question for the not as red as the red Ben and not as tall as the tall Ben. What would your wee free men name be? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, There's uh, one from me as well. well. Um, they're very good, but we've got a lot of questions to get through. I think Sven has skewered me, though, because I think I'd have to be the not as not as ginger as ginger Ben, but a bit more ginger than brown haired Ben. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> like, it'd probably be something like that. Because, I, you know, I, I, I was proper full-on ginger when i was younger but it is a blended dominant gene effectively so i clearly have a brown hair gene and a red hair gene and i was very red haired and i've gone browner as i've gotten older so i only look properly ginger mm-hmm. in the right light so i that's that might be the way to go that would distinguish me from all the other fegals called ben on the other hand i don't think any of them are called ben so <laughs> maybe i'll be okay um uh- I have actually have another Megan, not just in my workplace, but within my team in the workplace. So this is actually would be a very <laughs> useful thing for us to have. So <laughs> it's um, slightly little than the other Meg Megan or something like that would probably be necessary. So oh, Meg, that's a good that's a good vegan name though, Meg. That's Meg good. Meg would work. Megan probably not, but Meg would definitely work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, There's a Kelda named that somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if she wasn't just called the Kelda with a capital K. But she had to be called something before she was the Kelda. Yeah, I guess so. We never find out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was, that question was asked by, also by uh, somebody else, wasn't it, Liz? Oh yeah, um, by Red Red of the Endless on Twitter. So it's a good question from different angles. So yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. I don't really have a good one because I'm an only child, but there was another Elizabeth at school. Um, and that's why I sort of went through all of school as Elizabeth and not as Liz or Lizzie because she had the monopoly on the, on the names. So I guess I'd be like Elizabeth, not Liz, but, um, only on some occasions you can call her Liz Elizabeth. <laughs> Very long and convoluted ones. Which is well, what it should be. Is, which is what it should be. Yeah. That's appropriate. That's appropriate. I mean, it's is it really that much longer than not as we as medium sized jock, but not as big as big jock? Oh, I can't even get it right without looking at it. Oh, he'll correct you, don't worry. Oh, yeah. He'll, but very politely. Well, probably, well, actually, he probably won't be polite to me, will he? Um, what's the next question, Liz? It's one from James Beggs via Facebook. With We Free Men under production by the Jim Henson Company, do you think the Feagles look like little blue humans or more like doozers? For the young amongst us, doozers are the mostly featureless constructors from the Fraggle Rock universe. I can't answer that because I don't know what doozers look like, even with that great information. Uh, oh, no, doozers are great. And also, a follow-up question, could Grebo learn to love the Feagles? <laughs> I don't know. I think they'd fight a lot. But maybe they would really love fighting each other, and that's how they would be able to get along. Give each other purpose. Yeah, I could see that happening. Great respect but, between enemies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because uh, they're much stronger than him. <laughs> you know, like there's, he's not going to win. But on the other hand, he's much more. Well, is he more determined? I don't know. I think that'd be an interesting it could be a, uh, lineup. A great battle asset, though, because you know how like they brought that shape back, zooming back. They could like. Bring a Grebo into whatever the battle is, throw him in there as like an initial assault, <laughs> and then follow it up. That would be amazing. They could ride him into battle. Mm. Oh my god, it'd be like He Man and Battle Cat only gone horribly wrong. Um, I was imagining them as little blue humans, I think, is what I was proportionate wise. Yeah. I think mostly the illustrations are really good in, in the book here, and they, they are pretty much humans, but they have sort of slightly oversized heads. They're wiry, they're not like big, muscly tiny blue men they're like very spindly with uh you know long ginger hair and they've got all different haircuts and different colored kilts which actually i have to admit slightly bothered me because i'm like don't they have a tartan why are they all wearing different kilts i don't know they're all different colors and oh. but yeah i don't think they look like doozers i think they would use larger more detailed puppets but shrink them down and i don't know this is the other thing i don't know that that film is still in development what with the recent deal signed between narrativia and a new production company to have exclusive rights to make the disc world for the screen i wonder if that means that the jim henson version of the we free men is no longer in development which i think would be really sad i would love to see that this one's from rin bettencourt via facebook had a really nice comment but the question was as the knack figures try to be your friend they do tasks for you so what's the one task you'd let them do for you if you could only pick one i let them clean my bathroom i hate i hate cleaning my bathroom I hate I hate mopping. It's the worst. I've got a garden that um, needs a whole bunch of weeding, um, and I don't know what, where to throw the weeds when they're done. <laughs> is is a problem? So I feel like they could just like make that disappear for me. I think it would definitely be the dishes. We don't have a dishwasher in our place, and I did grow up with a dishwasher, so I don't accept that as the current condition. The way that my partner who didn't grow up with a dishwasher, he's just like, oh yeah, this is fine. This is a normal task to have to do every day. I'm just like, this cannot be stood. Has been stood for like. Six years now. Um, but if I had Nat McFeagles to do it for me, that wouldn't. I would never be washing the dishes again. It would just do that completely. So. Would you trust them to wash them properly? Or you wouldn't worry that they're like uh, licking them clean or something? I would trust them to wash them carefully. I wouldn't trust them to all end up where they're meant to be. I would imagine you would just open the cupboard and they would just be in completely random compositions or you'd find them in completely different drawers or places to where you expected or sometimes in other places around the house for no particular reason. Just because. Yeah. So, and sometimes they'd be missing ones just because they got broken. But that wouldn't be that different to what happens now. The things breaking and then mysteriously <laughs> no longer being full sets of things, really. But so You um, wouldn't have to put any effort into it, so it's a win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I feel like they wouldn't be as thwarted by cupboards being slightly taller than they are the way I am. So I feel like they would just be so used to getting into places that are taller than they are <laughs> that they'd probably handle it better than I do. So 
Right, I'm on board okay, with well. that. I'd send my fecals your way because that sounds like a much better case. <laughs> All right. I'd make good use of them. Uh, this one's from Lachlan by Discord. What word would you use for an optical onomatopoeia? I did some research into this and it's not quite that as a thing, but I did find there's a thing called the Bubo Kiki effect. This is real, which is a non-arbitrary mapping between speech sounds and the visual shape of objects. Uh, and they do this test where they have some words that have softer sounds and some words that have harder sounds and people associate the softer sounds that are made up with a rounder object and the harder sounds with a pointier object. There's a definite bias towards those associations. But as, in terms of what word you would use for it, so I'm just I'm just sort of using that as an excuse to put some research into the podcast. <laughs> um, totally but, um, fair call. I don't know what a good word for visual onomatopoeia is. I think it should start with the letters GL, though. I think we've established that's the traditional mm. kind of word you need to use. I'm just thinking glonomatopoeia now. I'm sorry. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's that. We'll coin that. That's good. Right, glonomatopoeia. Uh, this one's a quick one. Sven via Discord asks, will episode 42 be the truth? We'll never tell you until it comes up, um, and then we'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Neil via Twitter. <laughs> Um, although we've never met her, where in the pantheon of Discworld Twitches do you think Granny Aching sits? I have a pretty damned high despite knowing nothing about her. So this, I guess it depends on how you view her as in power-wise or as in how she sits in the hierarchy of witches, which there isn't one, but there is one. Yeah. I, it seems to me she's got to be up there. Like, I think she's at the Granny Weatherwax Nanny Og level, mm. like that general area. Um, but also she's gone more or less unnoticed by the broader witches because none of the witches we know about seem to know about her. And Miss Tick doesn't know about her, and she's a travelling witch. She's super localised, specialised, I think, is her thing. And she's, mm. like, great at what she does where she does it. Which is, seems to be the way for most witches. Yeah. She's kind of like a weird combination of Nanny Og, Granny Weatherwax, and that one before Magrat who, like, was real learned and travelled a lot, but, like... Like that, that, oh, the research witch. Yeah, that feeling of being a research witch. Because she had all her notes that she marked off the almanac and stuff, but without travel. So here's one I'd like to direct to you, Megan. Um, it's from Grace Ordung via Facebook. Why do you think Tiffany Aching books are classified as young adult? Is it because the protagonist is fairly young? To be honest, yeah, I think that is a huge part of it. I, I don't think the tone is hugely different from his adult books to be honest I didn't when I was reading it, it it didn't really clock to me the first time that it was actually intended as a young adult book but there is such a publishing tradition of if there's a protagonist of a certain age making a book like kind of pushing it towards that particular type of audience which I guess is just the idea that it's going to be easier to identify with the younger protagonist but I, I don't know what did you two think do you think that the tone was other than the the chapter headings and the reduction in footnotes compared to like the rest of it felt very familiarly ratchet to me. It didn't really feel too different tonally from the rest of his later books. I agree with that. Like I didn't feel like it was for a younger version of me. Mm. The only thing that made it slightly younger adult for me was that a few more things were explained that I don't think would have been explained in a Discworld book, but never like over the head hitting you with it sort of thing. So I do think it is because she is young. It's hard, like because like, the line between YA and everything else is quite blurry already. Mm. But yeah, I do think perhaps it is a disservice to try and nail down this one into that genre. I don't know. Like it's cause, like, I love reading mm. YA. Um, this is not like I'm worried I'm coming across wrong, but it doesn't feel specifically YA. It just feels like another version of a Discord book to me. So like the distinction is not. Yeah. Here. Well, I think tonally it's very similar to other Discworld, but I think the other thing that distinguishes it as maybe appropriate for middle grade readers, because it's not really young adult, I think it's it's pitched younger than that in the mm. in as much as it is pitched at an age, is also that it's about a child's experience. Like mm. Tiffany is not doing adult stuff. I mean, she's facing down a queen and re rescuing her brother, but she's not doing that with an adult context there's nothing in there about adult relationships or adult responsibilities or adult work or stuff that younger readers won't understand because they don't have that context in their own lives which is something that i kind of see in his other middle grade stuff as well maybe with the exception of the truckers books because you know the gnomes are not children but at the same time they live with a kind of childlike understanding of the adult human world 
so they kind of get away with it that way um and they're not human um but i think yeah like the johnny books you know this is written kind of from the perspective of an eight-year-old girl like we never leave tiffany's perspective in this book even though there are other major characters we never go off with them it's all from her perspective and it's all from her understanding so i think that's the other thing apart from just her being the protagonist is that we see it from her point of view which means it is presented in a way that a younger reader will find a lot easier to understand i listened to your podcast about equal rights recently and in a lot of ways that's tonally kind of like tonally it feels quite different even though it covers similar ground in some ways like this is about a child on the disc world discovering that they have magical powers right and in both situations it's a young girl and yet the experiences are hugely different and the way it's written is quite different so maybe but it's hard to tell whether that's because equal rights was such an earlier book whether it was rather than an intentional tone thing and continuing on from this theme there's one a, a question from des via twitter the tiffany book somewhat continued the witch's story arc which will otherwise end surprisingly early in the discord series what other subgroup would you have liked to see and get a ya continuation so from for, for des it's wizards and students focused that would be cool. You imagine a student wizards book. I mean, you get a kind of glimpse of what that might be like, I guess, a little bit in Unseen Academicals where the students finally have any kind of part in a wizards book, although it's fairly minor. That's an interesting one. What do you reckon? Assassins. Oh, yeah. I'd pay that. I kind of agree. I think, yeah, the, the students would be the best way to do something like this. I reckon it would be really cool to see, like, a young Sam book where it's like young Sam and we meet his new friends who we haven't met before and they, they're like kid detectives, like solving kid crimes in Ankh Morpork. I think that could be really fun. Young Sybil and her dragons? <laughs> yeah, young Sybil and her Oh, yeah, that's cool, a prequel series. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, this is a question specifically for you, Ben, um, from Steve Lay via Twitter. Um, mm. Now that you've covered all three books in the Bromeliad, Only You Can Save Mankind, um, and we've done The We Free Men, does Ben feel cheated that he allowed the For Younger Readers tag to deprive him of reading some of Terry's greatest works of all these years? Uh, well, totally I do. But the thing that I find most weird is that I did read Truckers, Diggers and Wings, and I loved them. They're still amongst my favourite Pratchett books. And I did read The Carpet People, and I did read all the Johnny Maxwell books. And for some reason it was mostly, I think it was because I got out of the habit of reading as much when these were coming out anyway, and when I saw that it was for younger readers, I was like, oh, I'll get around to it eventually. And I do regret it because I bloody love this book. and <laughs> I really can't wait to read the other Tiffany books. And there's one or two other books for younger readers that uh, I haven't read yet either. Like, I'm really excited to read those. So, yes, I do regret it. Absolutely. Um, this one's from Joel Mullen via Discord. Was it Le- Lily Weatherwack that did the toad in? And also, how far, if at all, did Tiffany feel from other Discord arcs on first read or reread? So we covered part two a little bit. But... I can answer part one canonically because the illustrated edition has a few little bits of additional content, one of which is the official court transcript of the court case where our lawyer friend gets turned into a toad and the name of the fairy is given. The fairy godmother is called the fairy nettle, who I assume is not Lily Weatherwax, although she's referred to as the fairy nettle rather than a fairy godmother who we no generally on the disc world is actually a witch given a magic wand so it's a little bit ambiguous i guess but she's also described as ms nettle so who knows uh but doesn't seem to be lily weatherwax maybe that's one we could take to a poll yes but it's hilarious and if you can get your hands on a, an illustrated copy I, I recommend you check it out there's a couple of hilarious things in there All right, um this one's from grace lee by instagram which is a question and a comment tiffany calls the queen out for being bad because her king isn't with her anymore do you find this to be a weak trope since the same thing was said to the elf queen in Lords and Ladies? Or does Pratchett not want his characters to be truly evil and want you to empathise with them in a way? Do women have to be scorned by men in order to justify their bad actions? Which is a great question. I think in this case, at least, it just feels like it's Tiffany's way into empathising with the character. And it doesn't feel like it have to be that. It feels like it could be a, a lot of different things. Um... But yeah, so for me, I just feel like it's her way of, um, of of finding an in or understanding the queen in some way. So while there are definitely some female characters in some Terry Pratchett books that I find a bit underdeveloped in some ways, this wasn't one where I really found it a problem. Because it's not Lily Weatherwax's thing either, and that's the other sort of mm. big lady showdown, I would say. Yeah. So like, 
it is a good comparison to make, but I wouldn't say it goes so far as a trope throughout the series. Mm. Yeah. I guess I didn't read it that way, but it seemed to me that mostly the reason that Tiffany brings it up is not to say this is why you're so awful, but mm. rather it's completely the opposite way around because in the context she's trying to piss off the queen. And mm. so she says, what can I say to make her most angry? And she actually says, you just live here in a land full of winter and all you do is dream of summers. No wonder the king went away. So it's not the king left you and that's why you're awful. It's like, you're awful. No wonder the king left you, mm. which is also tropey, but she's doing it to annoy her, to push her to anger for her own benefit. She is doing her version of what the queen did when the queen's pushing Tiffany's sore points mm. and saying, oh, you don't really love your brother. You are only trying to do good things now because you're being selfish. It's not because you're a good person doing good things. You're doing these things for the wrong reasons. So just the yeah. turnabout for that is, it's like, what what sore points do I know the queen has? Let me poke them. It, it just occurred to me that it's also quite a Shakespearean fairy world sort of thing to have the king and queen of the, the elves or the fairies fighting or falling out and coming back together again and stuff like that. Like There seems to be quite a, a history of these uh, fictional fairy worlds in which there's almost soap opera type stuff going on between the kings and queens the, that had gossiped about the same way as there might have been with kings and queens in the real world at that time to a, mm -hmm. a smaller extent maybe. So so I feel like maybe it, it more plays back to a sort of a Midsummer Night's Dream sort of thing more than something about female characters in general. Mm. Totally. I'm just going to round out Grace's question with their comment, actually. So Grace says, there's a beautiful passage where Tiffany realizes she didn't really know Granny Aching and talks about how they shared the silence. I've read this book several times, but having recently lost my granddaddy made me cry my eyes out. We talk a lot about how poignant Pratchett's writing can be about political or social issues, but we haven't given him credit on how well he addresses grief. So yeah, That's true. It's a good reflection, I think. Um, yeah, and he really does nail it too. Like His writing on death is always very, yeah, he's really good. Next question um, is a bit of a tonal shift from Lloyd Owens via Facebook. How big is your soup plate and how heavy was a frying pan and would you use your younger sibling as bait? Um, and this follows on with Sarah Isabella's question, which is what household object would you fight a Jenny Green teeth with? <laughs> uh, well, look, um, I would hope for a cricket bat because I'm not very sporty, but the one bit of sports equipment I know at least a little bit how to swing is a cricket bat. Do you bat. have an iron cricket bat? Because it won't do uh, much good if it's not iron. Uh, yeah, you've got a point there. You can dip it in iron? Um, Maybe a big, heavy iron spatula just feels a bit easier to wield than a than a frying pan. Not heavy enough. It'd sprung right off her. But she might be so confused that she'd leave. Look, the truth is Tiffany picked the best one. So we should all just be using frying pans. I don't have an iron frying pan, though. I just have normal frying pans. Would Teflon work? This is the question. Like, is, <laughs> is the non-stick capabilities of a fry pan going to be any use in this situation? So, If you're frying a Jenny Green teeth, you want your Teflon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're trying to smack one on the head, you want you want the iron. Uh, Especially if you want to put it in the oven afterwards. But yeah. Maybe a bit more brutal because I keep on – I was thinking, oh, what household objects in the kitchen could I use? And I, I, I wasn't knife, but I was like, there's meat forks. Meat forks would be pretty good, like the big skewer type ones if you needed a weapon. <laughs> and that would probably be more useful. What if you got Sorry. like a really long extension cord? They probably don't have electricity, but um, <laughs> went right down to the stream and just chucked your toaster in there. Well, they've got to be yes. hooking hex up to the magic somehow, right? But like in this community, do you think they have electricity? Oh, no. no. Definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. But like, Definitely I think not. a toaster could work if you could just get that, mm. that going. Oh, yeah. Mm. A bit of, yeah, a bit of, bit of sort of. Um, morning star kind of action big yeah, hefty yeah. tray could be all right but yeah oh yeah make a really satisfying gong sort of noise as well yeah <laughs> um i'm just on the size of the soup plate look i'm not fancy enough to own soup plates i eat my soup out of a bowl so did yeah. i like mine off of a tray so now i also have bowls <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so this one's from aaron dick via facebook I'd never heard of the Jenny Waterhorse thing, question mark, before this book, and got very confused. Is it a very common piece of folklore that I somehow missed? Am I alone? Um, I just wanted to say that I looked up this Jenny Green Teeth, um, and it is like a common folklore, but I hadn't heard of it. But um, there's also known as a Grindelo, they think, which is in Harry Potter. So, like, it's got different names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of Northern English mostly. I'd heard of it, but I this was my bag when I was a kid was like 
folklore and mythology, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't think she's that widespread. All right, so let's go to the final three questions. This one's from Nicola88 by Instagram. The monsters we see from fairy are all based on UK, Irish, and European folklore. Do you think if the queen invaded XXXX or Clatch, her minions would change? That's a great observation. Totally they would. Mm. Uh, mm. Because, you know, she's she's stealing from dreams. Uh, and if she was in those places, she'd be stealing from the dreams of the local people. Drop there. Yeah. But this is this is an interesting question that a lot of fiction has to deal with because if you posit that there is a real world of these other creatures and you only talk about say vampires and werewolves or you only talk about the fae in the sort of to arthur de Danon celtic mythology kind of fashion then what's going on in the middle east are there gins what's going on in australia what's a bunyip like are those things real and when you start to explore those i think that's when it gets interesting when you sort of push outside the stories that have been told so many, many, many times in mainstream media and in books. So I reckon, yes. No, I agree with that. Um, next question from Zoe by Discord. What is a word that always fascinated you or got stuck in your head or that you pronounced horribly wrong because you'd never heard it, only seen it written down? <laughs> the worst one for me when I was very young was stomach because I kind of saw how it was spelled, but I didn't quite put the letters together correctly and i used to say stotchma i thought we were coming for a stone match but like it's it's that that would make more sense but that is not what i said (laughs) when i was a kid it was terrible the letters were all there but they were not quite in the right order or the right sounds that was my worst one but the worst one i ever saw was i used to do a steadfords and um, one of my favorite events and in a steadford was the cold reading where they'd give you a passage to read and you'd do like a dramatic reading of it having not seen it more than a couple of seconds before. I loved it. I got quite good at it. But I remember one time we were given a passage from The Adventures of Baron Munchausen and I'd, I'd gone up and I'd done mine and then I was standing up the back to watch the other competitors and someone came in and they had never seen the word sabre before, spelt in the English fashion. The whole story was entirely about people fighting each other with swords. And so every time the word sabre came up, she said sabri. No. And Uh-oh. we were all going, no, no. <laughs> No. And I'm like, well, if you've never seen it before, I mean, yeah, we all felt very bad. But, you know, she, otherwise did very well. I was about 25 when I found out that they're not actually called bard chips. They're called bark chips. You know, those things you find in playgrounds that, yeah. Yeah. So I, because I'd moved bard here chips. from Hong Kong as a child and I heard it being said as bard chips and that's just what it stuck with me. So I'm like, you know, that's a weird name, but I mean. Maybe the company is called Bard or something. I'm sure I didn't think anything that sophisticated at that point. Not that that was sophisticated. It doesn't drink a coffee with its finger sticking out while wearing a monocle. But, um, yeah, so Bard Which one is inscribed with a quote from Shakespeare? <laughs> um, so that's probably my worst one. And the other word that I got obsessed with one time, we had a substitute teacher as a kid. And for some reason I decided that the word glinted was the only thing that I – would want to write about and we had to write short stories and I put glinted as literally like every fifth word even though I didn't really know what it meant and one point I accidentally used it correctly and she put three ticks next to it so I think she must have been like real <laughs> tired of my nonsense by that point so, yeah. <laughs> positive reinforcement mm-hmm. how about you Megan what shameful mispronounced word is in your past oh, um, no, there's no it- shame actually there's no shame here so much shame. We're going to judge you so much. Oh, no. Let me let me hide behind my, my dresser here. But um, <laughs> I feel like I can't remember any of the humorous ones from being a kid. And this probably is something that I still do all the time. So it's shameful that I can't remember a more specific one. But I feel like the only one I can think of, and I think it's just because my partner gave me so much about this one, um, which was that I used to say, like, for the band Kasabian, I used to say Kasabian all the time. It's like, we're going to go see you. Oh yeah, we're gonna go see Casabian. Or do you like that band Casabian? And it was just, it was, it was. Um, Again. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it was like, yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty dreadful. So, um, so yeah. that one I think has stuck in my mind, not because it was the worst one, but just because it was the one I was teased about the most. So therefore, it's <laughs> stayed in my mind the longest. So, but um, as someone who was trying to make sure she was saying aching and not acting through this entire thing, clearly this isn't entirely in my past. So. Well, you names, names are a whole other thing, right? Like yeah. Dungeons and Dragons is full of all these names that nobody really knows how to pronounce properly, except they do have proper pronunciations. 
and uh, there's a website which you use to reference them, which has now added little a little speaker icon, and you can hear a voice pronounce the words for you, like of all the names of all the monsters and stuff, so you can get them right. What actor got that really job? Cute. That's kind of amazing. I know. I wish I'd got that job. Yeah. That would have been so cool. Um, so this is a great question to round out on. It's from Molokov via Discord. If you were a traveling teacher, how much knowledge would you be able to impart for three carrots and half a dozen eggs? Oh. That's like a lot considering what they paid in the teaching sequence. So that's like, what, like an hour and a half, two hours worth of lessons? That's heaps. So basically, uh, what could you give a TED talk on like right now, I think? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. Well, clearly Terry Pratchett um, and how he intersects with the world of Doctor Who. <laughs> No, it's not very useful. What could I teach that would actually be useful? It doesn't say that it has um, to be useful, but I guess people have to be well, willing to that's... part with three carrots and half a dozen eggs. <laughs> um, maybe we need to change our uh, subscription options. To any major root vegetables. Yeah. I, could, I mean, I could talk about how to how to give a public speaking, how to, how to speak in public, actually. Um, how to give a public speaking. <laughs> how to give a public speaking. Not like that. That was my trap. <laughs> don't fall into it no uh i'm just trying to think what things i have usefully talked about and i do work teaching people creative writing so i guess that would be the most obvious answer that i should have come up with first mm. hmm. so while a lot of us at my library service have been working from home a lot of people have been producing podcast content for the first time so i guess if i was to give uh, three carrots and half a dozen eggs worth of useful information, possibly more useful than usual in this circumstance, it would be around how to record yourself with limited equipment and how to edit stuff to make people sound better, but not also as if they never say the word um. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's very useful advice. Uh, maybe we can talk after this is over and you can teach me how to do that. Um, <laughs> but I think that brings us to the end of the episode thank you so much megan for coming along thank you for having me if people want to hear your podcasts you you used to produce the kill your darlings podcast would you still recommend we listen to it or is it dead to you now (laughs) i mean you know since the break no i I would (laughs) highly recommend that you listen to the kill your darlings podcast they're still doing great work it hasn't vanished on my leaving much as it would be a really nice boost to my ego if it had um, so <laughs> yes and you'd still do make a podcast uh i do so i would recommend that you listen in to your local library services podcast there are quite a few library services that have started ones recently and there are some like city of melbourne who've been doing one for quite a long time it's a great way to at the very least catch up on events that you can't make it to in person even in situations where None of us can make it to things in person. So. All right, well, of course, we'll link to those in the show notes. Uh, but look, thank you so much for listening to us and joining us on this first foray into the world of Tiffany Aching. I've loved meeting her. I'm so excited to see where she goes from here and to follow her as she grows up. Because as I understand it, she does kind of get considerably older during the books. If she had any romance with Rob, I'm going to cut someone. <laughs> I think that's reasonable. <laughs> I'm not into that either. Yeah. He's a jerk. We will be back next month and we will be reading another Terry Pratchett book. That is, after all, the entire point of this podcast. And for all of those of you who listen, thank you so much. Thank you for those of you who sent very lovely comments in, as well as the questions this month. We had so many questions, we couldn't really get to all of them, but we do read them all and we really appreciate them. Thank you so much. Thank you again also to our supporters and our subscribers who help us continue making this podcast and make it sustainable without you we just couldn't do it so thank you so much if you want to learn more about that you can find out more on our website but we will be back next month and uh we've gone a little bit out of order because we wanted to get to tiffany aching so quickly but we thought well while we're here reading a younger reader's discord book we might as well do another one so what are we reading next time liz we're doing the amazing morris and his educated rodents i can't wait I, i this is another one i haven't read and i am pretty excited about it because for various stupid reasons i've always enjoyed the pied piper of hamlet myth and i'm pretty sure that is going to come up in this book in one way or another i feel quietly optimistic about that yeah 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 Yeah. but also it's about a cat and we'll be joined by Uh, michelle law she's a writer a screenwriter and a big cat lover so i think this is going to be a good fit um so i'm very much looking forward to that so thank you thanks again megan and until next time Don't go a-hunting for fear of we free men. 
You've been listening to Pratchat, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Megan Dew. Pratchat is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchat Podcast and listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via PratchatPodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat32. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrors. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.